Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. John DeLynn. It is November 24th, 2021, and we are super excited. It's the day before Thanksgiving in the United States, and we are super excited for this special interview on Mormon Stories Podcast. I am uh, joined today, as always these days, by my wonderful co-host, Kara Burrell. Hey, Kara. Hey, John. Happy almost Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy almost Thanksgiving to you. How are you doing? I'm so excited. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Do anything fun for, for Thanksgiving? Spending time with family. That's what it's all which about. Which is really fun. Yay. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us. And uh, you guys are in a real treat uh, today. Um, we are really excited to have in studio uh, Gerald and Mackenzie Benzie. Welcome, guys. Hi, Jen. Thanks all, for having us. All the way from Atlanta. All the way. Yeah. By car. You drove? <laughs> we yeah, drove. we did. From Atlanta? Yes. Holy moly. That's how much we love this podcast. Oh, my gosh. So. We sacrificed our sleep for you, John. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I was honored already. Now I'm doubly honored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I've been, I've been telling people for a long time, you know, like when we had Roger Hendricks on Mormon Stories podcast, he told us that the church's strategy is, is to bet all in on Africa. And uh, while the church loses its membership in the United States, Canada, Western Europe, and it's even losing in Mexico and Latin America and the Philippines in many ways, it, it seems like the church is really banking on its future growth being in sub-Saharan Africa. So I've had a call out for, for a long time for listeners and viewers who uh, would like to come on Mormon Stories if they're from Africa to kind of tell their story. And I, I don't know if that's <laughs> what made you guys reach out or not, but part of what's super cool about this story is that we get to hear from Gerald Benzi, who uh, grew up in Zimbabwe yes. and joined the Mormon Church. So that's going to be part of today's episode. But we also have McKinsey, who's got her own epic story. And there's a, a mixed racial marriage, which in Mormonism has its own meaning and, and implications and connotations. So we're in for a really cool, epic, multi-hour Mormon Stories podcast interview uh, today and also faith crisis stuff built in. So, guys, thanks so much for being willing to do this interview. We're really You're excited. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess we can we can jump in. Uh, and uh, even though, McKinsey, you were kind of raised in the church. Right. And, Gerald, you converted to the church uh, in your young adult years. Yes. I thought it would be cool to go ahead and, Gerald, have you start um, since we – I, if my memory serves me, and I always tend to forget, I think you're the first sub-Saharan African to ever be interviewed on Mormon Stories podcast. Wow. It feels good to be a pioneer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. Aww. Gerald has a sense of humor, Kara. <laughs> we like that. Um, yes, he does. All right. Yeah. Pioneer Gerald. <laughs> Where does your non-Mormon story begin before it becomes a Mormon story? We'd love to hear. Okay. Uh, so I was... Uh, Born and uh, raised in Zimbabwe. I was born in a rural area called uh, Weza. Um, most people who are from Africa, they will know that Zimbabwe is next to South Africa. So I use that to direct people ge geographically so they'll know where I'm, where, where, what I'm talking about. So I was born and raised in, in Zimbabwe. Uh, my father's side of the family, they were not really Christians. They were into... Um, our spiritual, traditional spiritual, uh, you know, practices. And my mother's side, they were Christians. But uh, my father was not uh, actively practicing the spiritual stuff. So we grew up uh, adopting my mom's religion instead. Can, so, I, can I ask, what would traditional Zimbabwean or African spirituality even be like? Just just a brief yeah. explanation. I'm just curious. So um, it's pretty much the same as Christianity, but I would say without Jesus. Okay. You know, so they do believe that we have a superior being we pray to. So in Shona, we call that uh, Musikavan, meaning creator of people. So that's who they pray to. But they use uh, people who have passed, so our ancestors. So say, for example, just to give you like a little... Um, a little uh, explanation to how these practices go. So say your grandparents, right? Uh, they pass and then you come around and then your kids. So when we are praying to our superior being, your kids will be like, um, John, can you talk to our ancestors so they can tell the superior being 
mm. our concerns because we did believe that people who die they will enter the spiritual realm and they are the only ones who can talk to the creator of men mm. so that's why we ask them to be like, hey this is our message we know that we cannot directly speak to him can you pass it on mm. so that's mm. kind of like so to me that's where jesus comes in right like he eliminates that like okay now you don't need to talk to your dead loved ones so they can convey the message to god so it's pretty much like that so we do fun stuff during those ceremonies like we brew beer we dance all night we you know so basically like we want our voices to be heard so we keep doing that and until we are satisfied until the spirits are appeased sometimes it's accompanied by a sign i never witnessed those signs but there are older people uh people who can tell you like oh it's enough they hate it so now we can go home go about our day our prayer <laughs> our prayer has been sent to uh, the creator of men so that was my dead side but uh my mom's side uh my grandparents uh they were i think my my granddad was an Ang- anglican I, i'm not really sure but my mom was always into christianity so we grew up reading the bible and then i mean we would take a sneak peek to my dad's side we're like so dad when is the ceremony happening and he's like we're not participating in that i'm not part of that but uh so but the other thing about my father too is he took pride sending us to mission schools so Christianity was like a big part of our life. Um, so I guess uh, in a summary, I uh, would say uh, growing up, going to church every Sunday, like the gener- I mean, the traditional generic Christian life was pretty much what we lived. We went to church every Sunday, despite us being baptized or not baptized into my mom's church, she always take us there. But my dad did not go to church with us for a while. He would stay home. So it was always an option for us like hey uh, we are not going to force you to go to this church as you can see your father's not going my dad used to drink at that time like he would go to a bar and things like that but he was also really well with the bible like we would debate with him whilst he was drunk which is the one of the funniest thing we did when i was little is to ask him religious stuff when he's drunk and we'll ask him so why you, why do you drink when you're not drinking is bad and then he would take us on this run where it's like drinking is not bad you know and then like you'll be like teaching us how to drink responsibly even though we're little kids and my mom hated that i'm pretty sure if she hears this she be <laughs> she would still be mad that i'm saying this <laughs> because she was against drinking and my dad would be just like it's fine i'm i'm not teaching them to be drug addicts i i just want them to drink responsibly which is something i always tell my kids i'm like i kind of appreciate that because i was never one of those teenagers who were like i want to drink i want to drink and i tried because by the time i go to that stage i can't understood what beer was you know and also in our culture when we do the ceremonies i was telling you about people are drinking you know so beer was not like a taboo taboo we grew up around it i used to help my grandma uh brew it so i kind of knew how to do it i kind of knew how it tastes but i i never got drunk as a kid you know so seeing people getting drunk in around me it was never like a stigma you know because like oh yeah don't drink or you know you end up in the streets or something like that it wasn't like that real, real quick yeah. what was the what language was spoken in your home it's called shona okay so english is your second language yeah english is my is second right? language yeah okay yeah but uh so if you go to zimbabwe we have tribes but the two are largest are the majority of people are shona tribe so pretty much everyone speaks shona but again we're a british colony so everyone was forced to speak english so in such a way that if you go to zimbabwe right now you'll be surprised that when people just approach you they're just gonna speak in english so you'll be like wait do you guys have any <laughs> any tradition so that's how we are like so we are weird in that way that we have a bunch of people who just speak english you know whenever we see someone foreign we always speak in english like it's it has been like our thing the entire time so most people also kind of think like english is our first language which is not true i've actually seen a documentary online saying oh yeah the official language the first language for zimbabwe is english and i was like mm, no it's not <laughs> <laughs> you know? so that that's how we are like so and then, and then also sorry what was your parents education levels well what what level of education did they each obtain and mm. 
what was their professions if they had professions? So my mom, I think she she went as far as high school, and uh, so there was a program I think of uh, Red Cross nurses back in that in that in those days. I do not know how it really worked, but I know that she was in one of those programs. I don't know if they were like a nurse assistants or nurse aides. I don't know that the actual term they were called. So that's what she did. But my dad uh, was a teacher. So he did went uh, to a teacher's college and later on, uh, I think he obtained his master's in animal science. So he became a headmaster. That's what we call them back there, back home. I don't know if that's the of same. what type of school? Uh, the school that he went to? No, that he taught, became the headmaster of. Oh, so it's like a secondary school. Like a high school. Yeah, like high okay. school, yeah. Okay. So yeah, he was a, a principal. Like a principal of a high school. Okay, yes. got yeah. it. Yeah. Got it. So well-educated. I mean, if he's like talking to you about the Bible and talking to you about responsible drinking and and um, challenging Christianity, like it, it means that he's a pretty thoughtful guy. He was, yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, uh, we, uh, we lost him uh, this year. Oh no. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, but pretty much uh, that's who he was. And he always, uh, he was that kind of person who was like, if something does not feel good to you, it's not good. You mm. know, like always, always listen to yourself first. Whoa. And then make a judgment. So that's, that's like woke. That's yeah. super advanced. Like so many of us are just now figuring that out. He yeah. Had that figured out decades ago. From a very little age, that's what he was teaching me. And I always tell my kids, I'm like, I got in trouble so much because of that. Because I <laughs> became this little boy. A, uh, yeah, a little the boy. System. Yeah, <laughs> in your favor. I, you did not, I did not like that. I, every time I was told to do something, even at school, and I'm like, this does not feel okay. <laughs> and I, when I was little, I was quiet. But I would vocalize when I'm un uncomfortable, yeah. which my teachers did not like because... They used to use me as an example, like be quiet, like Gerald, you know, be still like him. Then all of a sudden, I'm like, we shouldn't go to break right now. <laughs> so I'm like, let's keep reading, and everyone is like, why? <laughs> you know, so something like that. So I've been always like steering uncomfortable conversations when I was little. So, but I got that from my father. That's what his approach is, especially when it comes to spiritual stuff. He was always like, yeah as long as you feel a certain connection to your spirituality, which I, it took me years and years to understand what he mean by, oh, if you have a connection to your spirituality, mm. to me in my head, spirituality means doing good. I was just like, yeah, it means we're doing good, right? I'm yeah. being nice, I'm being polite to other people. It wasn't about like actually, you know, connecting to a superior being like, like what people were like in my culture. So I carried that idea probably applying it in a weird way for years and years and years and years. And he was older and I went to a mission school. That's when he started making sense to me because I would question what the Catholics were teaching as a student. And I'd be like, so can you explain? What types, what were like your three biggest questions or like concerns with Catholicism? Do you remember? I, I do. <laughs> so what happened to me is, so I went to mission school when I was 12 years old. And uh, coming from a community that was like super into our traditional stuff, drinking wasn't an issue, but then I met Christians who would tell people not to drink, right? But at that point, I never like understood where they were coming from with that. And then I went to a Catholic school, right? And they were drinking, right? Like they would drink wine. As in part of the religious service. Exactly. So that was something I kept asking them, like, mm. so can you explain to me? So which is, um, like, uh, I would equate it to people who are familiar with the word of wisdom, right? Like, okay, let's not drink. So imagine going to a church where alcohol is in the church, right? And you are coming from this background where uh, the Christians you've met, they have told you that alcohol is bad. Now you're in this institution where the priest himself, like he drinks after in after hours, you know, after, after he's done with his office hours, like who would see them? Because it was a rural uh, area. So there was literally one bar in mm. one store that would sell liquor. Yeah. So everyone who wants liquor will go there, including the priest. So like just seeing that kind of confused me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, okay. 
Can mm. you explain how alcohol is not bad to you? You know, because I understood that people who played with Jesus Christ were telling us alcohol is not good, you know. Right, right. So I remember asking that and I did not get a definite answer. And then the other thing uh, I asked, which I got in trouble for in school, was, uh, you know, worshipping idols. I had a hard time going into a church where there's a giant statue in front of me and do your rosary, kneel, pray in front of that statue. I struggled with that. Even up to today, I cannot explain it for sure, for sure, like how that feeling came. But I remember asking, because we would have a, a class with our priest too. In our curriculum, there was a class dedicated to us talking to the priest. I remember asking him that, but I think my wording and my tone I used, he did not like it. So I got punished for that, which did not do any good for me because I brought that story home and I told my dad and I was like, this is what happened in school because they would write a report every term. Your son, you know, did so and so and so and so. And at that time, I think part of my story initiated a movement where Catholic parents started asking the school not to enroll non-Catholic students. Oh, because they were asking questions. Because they were asking questions yeah. about uh, the Catholic church. And they did not like that because their kids never questioned that, you know, but they will go home and then they will tell stories like, oh, this guy got in trouble because he asked about this. But, you know, that is triggering to someone who was born and raised, especially like their parents were like really conservative about it. So it's something that I did not realize at that moment. But I remember my dad saying that at one point, like mentioning it to his friend, like, oh, yeah. This the kid. So I asked him, and I was like, what do you mean? You are telling your, your friend, this is the kid. And he's like, oh, I told him about your story when you almost got suspended at school. Mm. So that was like a moment I realized like, oh, I might be asking really valid questions. If he took that to the bar, his friend is like, let me tell you what happened with my little son. Yeah. You know? So I had those, I mean, those were like few examples that I clashed with the Catholic Church. And also the other thing too that I did is, uh, you know, they have savers, right? Like those um, outer boys you see who were, you know, they're saving the priest. So you had to be a Catholic, you know, and then you had to take classes and then you had, you had to do that. I was not a Catholic, but this is one of the most, I don't know, I feel bad about it now, but back then I was curious. I went to the savers room and I was not a Catholic. I couldn't even uh, receive the communion. the communion, yeah. And I sat there, watched them, listened to them, and I wrote my name on the ro on the register on the roster. So what they would do is like they would pick people who will save in masses. So they would just be like, okay, on Monday is John, Philip, and Gerald. So my name came up, and I went there, put on the uniform, and I started saving. That'd be like a non-Mormon kid passing the sacrament in, yes. in church, right? <laughs> yes. That, that's the equivalent of exactly. some kid signing up to pass the sacrament <laughs> who's never been baptized or received the priesthood. Yeah. A naughty, naughty Gerald. <laughs> exactly. You and, feel bad? And, and there have been stories growing up when people would tell us, like, if you receive the communion and you're not a Catholic, like, bad things will happen to you. <laughs> and they were like, a lot of false stories, like, oh, the communion turned into blood, blah, 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 you know, a lot of things. And I literally went there. I took it. Walked out, never said anything. <laughs> Waited the entire school term, nothing happened. Up to now, I have people I went to school with who would think I am like a legitimate guy <laughs> because they watched me doing that, right? <laughs> but it never happened to me. But God didn't strike you down. He did not. I wasn't smarter than turning into worms or anything. So <laughs> I was like, worms. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, So is this really? Is this really making sense to you people? Mm -hmm. But at that time, I was so afraid to uh, engage with anyone and tell them like, hey, I did this thing because at our school, that was an offense, you can get expelled. Like, okay, you did that. So, but later on in my high school, I started telling people, I was like, yeah, that cookie you eat does not mean anything because I <laughs> ate it, you know? So that was pretty much my my childhood then. But do, do, do Catholics, as you were growing up, were you raised to to think that Catholics still believed that the wafer turns into the literal flesh of Christ and the wine turns into the literal, the transubstantiation doctrine? Uh -huh. Were you taught that that was real? 
Yeah, I, I did. Yeah, I, I, I remember this. This is part of the reason why my experience, which I took risk on myself, like trying to do that, kind of, literally reverse. Like, I took a three sixty after I did that because it did not seem real to me to hear people teaching that doctrine. Now I'm like, no, I did to get it's a cookie and wine. <laughs> it's like not it does not flesh and blood. It's not. Yeah. But being that young, you know, I did not have enough ammo to go against that doctrine, you know. Yeah. So I would sit in those classes and people would say it and I'll be smacking in the back. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, man, this is this feels weird. But I did ask my dad about that. I remember having a conversation with him, uh, which mom, I'm sorry, he told me not to tell you. And he's like, We here's the thing. I as much as I want you to respect school rules. Like this was bad, 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 you know? He never encouraged me to keep on doing that. But at the same time, he also told me that like, this is how spiritual things work and like faith work. work. Uh, if you believe something is going to affect you and you believe that, for real, for real, you might start experiencing things that align with that belief because you are keeping on reinforcing it to yourself and your mind and your consciousness. Like, okay, if I eat this cookie, bad things are going to happen. So you are walking around with that mentality in life. So it's like, this is why probably this cookie did not affect you because you don't walk around believing it. Mm. So you took it yeah. and you are like, this is nothing. So it is nothing to oh, you. Okay, okay. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily mean to another Catholic boy who believed this is Maybe nothing. it would have worked yes. for him. So, yeah. So I would say like, yeah, it felt weird that time because I did not grasp the concept he was trying to tell me. Mm -hmm. To me, I got away with murder. I, as a kid, I was just like, well, <laughs> that's what I did, you know, and it's fun. Nothing happened. So, yeah, pretty much um, uh, from my mission school in my community, like between those two things, I I got the same Christian values that any other Christian like would have. Funny thing is um, most people who talk to me, they think uh, our traditional culture wasn't is not conservative. It's super conservative. So transitioning from our traditional culture into Christianity is the easiest thing we can do. Mm. Like literally it is, it feels like home when you are a Christian. The only thing that is so much different, like I said earlier on, is the idea of Jesus Christ. Because our superior being in our traditional culture doesn't have a son. We don't talk to him through his son. We talk to him through past loved ones. So that's, right. that's pretty much the biggest change. But everything else, yeah, it's still like, it's very like a uh, gender road, you know? So in Christianity, if you come and they tell you like, oh, women shouldn't preach. Well, yeah, in our traditional culture, if you look at it too, when ceremonies were being performed, usually they were done by men, you know? Yeah, women would help brewing the beer and stuff like that. So already it's not a big shocker to you to hear those things because you kind of understand already, okay, yeah, these roles are kind of assigned based on that, like, are you a man, are you a woman, you know, are you a child? Oh well, yeah, if you're a child, you can get, you can get as far as this level, you know? So you can relate with uh, different religions. Like, yeah, kids pass the sacrament. They don't, they don't go, you know, uh, they don't do anything beyond that, which is literally the same thing with us passing around those cups of beer, even though we didn't drink the beer, but that was our role. You have to make sure it's distributed around and then people get drunk and high and talk to whoever they're talking to, right? <laughs> so it was pretty much the same thing, which which brought me to being a Christian with my mom now. So going to my mom's church, I observed that. So my mom's church was kind of a spiritual. I don't know if we can call them Pentecostals or what, I don't know. But... They were kind of like uh is it charismatic speaking in tongues and, yeah speaking in tongues giving visions uh prophecies and stuff like that which is super amazing because as much as i wasn't attached to my mom's church a lot of things that i saw seemed real and felt real you know so i think i was 14 or, no i was 16. I decided to get baptized into my mom's church. And we kind of sat uh, in the house and she was asking me, are you sure you want to do this? You know, you have to commit and things like that. 
But it didn't really matter to me. I just wanted to be part of my mom's family. The other reason why I wanted to do that was my dad stopped drinking at some point in his life and he started going to my mom's church. So that was a big turn turn around point for for us. And what, what did the family life improve when your dad stopped drinking? Was it good for your family? Yeah, good for your dad. It was good for him because I mean, part of the reason why I say that is so. This is what he did. Um, my grandpa, my mom's father, died, and my dad was really close to him. You know, they used to drink together. You know, a lot like they were they had a good relationship. So that really affected him when he passed. And he kind of became a different person because there was also like a controversy surround, surrounding my grandpa's death. Like people believe he was poisoned and my dad felt like he knew who did that. So it really affected him. So he stopped drinking, like just stopped. Wow. Yeah. So he wasn't going to bars anymore and anything. And then all of a sudden, one Sunday, he used to draw as a church and then he would go back home. One Sunday, he just like stayed. So we're like, oh, maybe he will leave. He, he didn't. He stayed the entire service and went back home. We didn't talk about it or anything. Then he just kept doing that. He just kept doing that. And then all of a sudden, he got baptized. So I wasn't out at that point. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, do you, can we talk about this? You know, but I didn't know how to initiate it. But we also do, do did understand uh, that he was on a journey, you know, starting from my grandpa passing. So yeah, that kind of motivated me to be like, okay, maybe I can also, you know, get baptized. So I, I did decide to do that. So then I was baptized. But after my baptism, I realized that I signed up for something that I did not really understand, you know, because now I was part of the church. I had to, you know, participate and get roles, you know, in our church, little boys, in my mom's church, little boys used to open for preachers and it was random. They would just like be like, oh, hey, Gerard, do you want, do you want to open today? You know, then they will read the scripture, then you preach. So preaching, like what evangelicals do, is something I can do, not because I was trained to do it, but because I was exposed to a lot of people doing it. So it was like a freestyle when you're little and everyone in the church would be encouraging you like, go do it, go do it, go do it. And I also realized like I was one of the little boys who would just repeat what they had, what they had the other uh, preachers saying. It's not like I actually believed what I was saying or like, mm-hmm. you know, or it was my own stuff. I just like borrowed stuff and then I, I would do that. So I became part of my mom's church. But so I was juggling between going to school <laughs> as a Catholic, coming home, joining this church that is non-Catholic. And that also gave me more ammo to go to the Catholics and like, okay, so I know these guys who say this about this, like, do you guys believe this? You know, and my friends who were mostly Catholics were like, wait, what? What are you talking about? I'm like, people receive visions. Do you know that? They're like, no, that's not true. Then I would, I would tell them stories from, from my church, you know. But that was uh, something even up to today, I do not really understand why they do that or how they do it. Because I have a few uh, people come up from my mom's church who are spiritual, who told me stuff that actually happened to me. But... I did not really believe them in the moment. You know, it's not, I don't feel like that, that was my faith at that time. So I'm, I'm still kind of digesting that, you know. So which brings me like uh, going to high school and college now, where I'm still going, these are still Catholic institutions I'm still attending at that point, you know. And I'm still trying uh, to see if I can relate to Catholics since I cannot relate to my mom's church. But at the same time, no one in the Catholic church is actually answering my questions in a way that makes me want to be part of them. But from since age 12, I've been part of their institution. So I've, you know, part of me feels like we've already invested time in these people. Maybe these are our people. We cannot like just for a second, we cannot just switch and tried to find another religion that I was not familiar with. And uh, by that time, 
I would see uh, missionaries from other churches, like uh, the Anglican, they still have uh, Anglicans, uh, what's the other one? Jehovah's Witness. Uh, Jehovah's Witness are the ones who have the the magazine, right? Yeah, the Watchtower. Watch yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I would see those guys a lot. And I remember uh, taking, I mean, talking to them several times because I they would leave those books and stuff. But that did not convince me otherwise, you know. And uh, I talked to the uh, Seventh Day Adventist to, and I realized that they don't like Catholics, so they come off. They came off to me like they are trying to make me like choose between them and Catholics. It was the mom the moment they realized like you were a Catholic, like they start bringing stuff like you're not supposed to go to church on Sunday. You know, Saturday is the real Sabbath. These people are doing this wrong, you know. And I'm like, okay, I I don't want you to teach me based on how other people are doing something wrong. Like I want to understand your church. So I did try for a little bit, try to understand them, but I had a problem with other things that they just do. Like uh, on a Friday, Friday was like our happy day, you know, growing up. I did not feel fine, like letting go of everything by 6 p.m. And kind of the, the Jewish Sabbath from like Friday evening to Saturday yes. evening. Yes. The Seventh Day Adventists would exactly. be Exactly. And I did not even realize that we, we do not cook on a Saturday. Right. Yeah. So that made me feel like I don't think I can <laughs> I can sure. have a lifestyle like this apart from them like being spiritual and everything but I was like I don't know I don't know if I can do this and in my house coming back home and talking about those things my dad entertained that like because my other siblings went to Anglican uh, mission schools so they will also come home and they will tell us how they are being taught you know by Anglicans and I would talk about how I'm being taught by Catholics and also interacting with other people, you know, who were not, uh, who were not either Catholic or Anglican and stuff like that. So religion became like a topic at our dinner table, which we enjoyed partly because in his drunk days too, it was entertaining for us. But at that stage now, it was kind of getting more real since now he, gave away his lifestyle of drinking and stuff. Now he belonged to my mom's church. So it, it was fine for me to debate people about the Bible, about religion, about your church doctrine. Yeah, I didn't feel like it's something people get too personal about at, the, at that point, you know. It's reminding me a little bit of Joseph Smith's upbringing because I think Joseph Smith Sr. drank and, uh -huh. and then I think there was a lot of religious vari variation and debate and discussion in the home because there was so much variability. So in some ways it's, it's reminding me of <laughs> Joseph Smith's upbringing. True. I do want to ask you, do you have a way to remember kind of how Mormons were viewed or maybe are viewed in Zimbabwe by people who didn't grow up with them and would just have a casual perception about Mormonism? Do you remember how, how Mormons were viewed if they were viewed at all by the common Zimbabwean? Yeah, so that's uh, something that uh, I was super excited, like to understand with other people who knew them. Because when I was in Zimbabwe, I did not know about the church. I have seen missionaries because I mean now I remember they were missionaries because of how they dress. I do remember thinking that they were kids going to a high school because. Pretty much everybody in Zimbabwe wore a uniform, white shade, gray pants or black pants or whatever. So that's what they look like to me. But I do not remember actually encountering Mormons in, or, or even hear anyone talk about them. But surprisingly, my mom knew about the Mormon church and we never talked about them. So I do not really. Really? Yeah. I do not really know how people viewed them, you know, like, or how people talked about them. But the the other thing too is in Zimbabwe, um, uh, which is really interesting uh, with how uh, I mean you introduced at this podcast, like that you <laughs> you wanna know how the change is gonna uh, you know shift their focus to Africa. I think Africa is a flooded market when it comes to religion. You know what I mean? Because pretty much from the get go of people going to Africa, they were there with religion, right? So you would find that like most popular religions that people talk about are people who have schools, 
people who have colleges, people who were there before, uh, I mean, the, uh, the church even, you know, shifted their focus to Africa. And I think right now, maybe they say they're announcing it. They announced a temple in Zimbabwe. So that's just going to be one amongst, I don't know how many cathedrals in Zimbabwe, like plenty. So I never heard about the church. I think their membership is probably really small in Zimbabwe. So I, I never encountered anyone who who actually introduced me to them or even like mentioned them. And Mormonism itself, I did not hear that word when I was in Zimbabwe until I left. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. I did not hear about so it. So the church is really behind, uh, I mean, Africa has been colonized forever by yes. everyone basically. So mm -hmm. the church is really behind. Yeah. Yeah, in interesting. Okay, so no real understanding of what Mormonism was growing up. Nope. Sure. Yeah, and I just looked it up. It said in 1975 there were 689 members in Zimbabwe, and in 2019 there were around 34,000 with 87 congregations. And uh, I think, like you mentioned, a temple that's had the groundbreaking, but it's not yet built yet. Yeah, I think so because uh, I think they announced it in 2016, if if I'm not mistaken. Because it's around the time just before I converted. Because I I remember people were celebrating. I attended the general conference before I was a, a Mormon. And I remember people celebrating about it. And my my friend, who was a Mormon, mentioned it to me. He was like, oh, they're going to build a temple in, in Harare. And I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Because I did, not, I did not understand how big of a deal that was. I was just like, oh, sure. I mean. A building. Yeah, it's a building. So I, there are plenty of those there. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't, right is it going to be in the CBD? I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I, I did not. I have an understanding of how people viewed Mormonism, but I, if if someone was to take a wild guess, like I would think any other similar religion to that, that's pretty much how they how they view them. But care to your point, that's uh, is that pretty big growth? You know, I feel like it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, between say it again, the 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 numbers in the years. Uh, that would be nineteen seventy five, mm -hmm. around seven hundred members. Okay, uh -huh. and so. And you can do the math of how many years it's been since then. And then this update, it doesn't say 2021, it says 2019. Okay. So we'll have to go by two years ago. It's probably grown even more since then, but 34,330 members with 87 congregations. Yeah. yeah it's a lot of growth. So, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. And you're an example of the growth. <laughs> <laughs> I contributed to that statistic. So. <laughs> okay. So a lot of religious uh, discussion and variability in your home. You converted at some point, but you're still, I mean, I, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that you were kind of a critical thinker as a kid, your dad, maybe, maybe your mom too passed that on to you. So you're experiencing various religions, but you're also thinking a lot and analyzing. And I'm just always fascinated with how critical thinkers end up joining high demand religions. Like how does that, how <laughs> the world this conversation does that happen? Many times. <laughs> like, wait, how? <laughs> but you, I mean, to your dad's credit, it wasn't only religion that you talked about. I mean, there was a lot of science background. And yeah. so from all angles, just critical thinking in general. I mean, religious conversion is primarily an emotional phenomenon. So even though we can talk all about the intellect, right. just like with your dad, he's a critical thinker, but his dad dies. It's a traumatic experience for him. Well, all of a sudden he's converting to Christianity. Like mm -hmm. religious conversion right. is, is pretty much an emotional and social thing. Very opportunistic. Rarely an intellectual <laughs> thing. So uh, that's my, I'm, I'm jumping to the end, but <laughs> so I'm dying to hear how you end up joining the church. So keep going. So now after college, right, I graduate. In what did you study in college? Uh, applied chemistry. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was in Zimbabwe at that time. Then uh, I got an opportunity. Oh, wait, you mentioned, sorry, in your outline, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to make sure you cover something. Uh -huh. You mentioned being raised with purity culture in your family, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What would that mean? To what is what would purity culture in Zimbabwe kind of mean? So, uh, like I said, that uh, there are a lot of things in Christianity that also exist in our uh, traditional in our traditional culture. One of the major things I can point out that pretty much every Christian can relate to is sexuality. You know. In our culture also, being a virgin was like something that we were taught 
and it was always portrayed as something that is really good and beneficial to you in the future. Until you get married, basically. Stay, Until you stay get virgin. married, yeah. yes. Okay. And our culture is also kind of brutal. Like if you if you read stuff that used to happen back in the day, like uh, in the ancient time, like that practice could um, virginity could bring losing virginity could bring shame to your family. You know, because there was some weird thing they would do, like that they would confirm that for real, for real, she was a virgin, and then they would have to communicate that to your family, which was weird. I, d- I don't really know the details, but I, I knew that it involved like some piece of cloth being folded or something like that, and then people will visit like the honeymoon suite, I can call it that, and then if that cloth is folded a certain way, they will know that she was a virgin or she was not or something like that which was really brutal, you know what I mean? And I'm guessing that the, the, something to do with the hymen, and if the hymen gets ruptured, yeah, and there's blood, and there's blood yeah. that's a sign, which is not a great way to know because mm-hmm. that can that can rupture in all sorts of different ways and all different times. Exactly. But that's the cultural heritage yeah. that kind of... So, so, so yeah, so those were, those were the things that, w- that would teach us, you know, like, yeah, make sure, like, you preserve yourself until you meet the right one, then you get married, because if you don't, you're going to bring shame to the family, and they will think you belong, you know, you are not taught well, you are not raised well, which, you know, your family will get bashed for, which is pretty much similar to Christianity, like, okay. Yeah, and know. Mormonism, that yeah. sounds quite familiar. It's like, yeah, it's like a trophy you will hold at the end. Yeah, you know. So they didn't tell you until the honeymoon? No, it's, it's not like they did not tell you. It's like, so when you go to the honeymoon, right? If I find out, say, you were, you were not a virgin, like we will, I will leave that cloth for the decision away, then your aunts will visit, your aunts and my aunts will visit their suite. Then they will, will both observe that, that cloth and they'll be like, well, yeah, she was not. So they yeah. can go home and shame her? I don't know what they would do about it, but I mean, my thinking, I would, Think maybe because we pay bright price back home, maybe we will negotiate the bright price. It wasn't worth it, you know. So she wasn't worth seven cows. Like a dowry or whatever. Yeah, like dowry. Yeah. So we we, we do pay, we do pay that. So I I think that will contribute. Like okay, so now you owe us because we did give you all. We, we paid you as if she were a virgin. Exactly. Turns out she's not. She's give not. us some of our money back. Exactly. Wow. I, so I, I don't know exactly how they would deal with the situation where she's not, yeah. or if they will ask some of their money back, or oh. it would just be like this thing that hangs out that they will hang <laughs> on your family's head every time. We're like oh, you cannot do that because you know you duped us. I do not know how they handle wow. that. <laughs> wow. So yeah, so su- such things like existed in our culture, you know, and there are like a lot of uh, uh, practices that way, just like related to to marriage itself. Like they would they would have like these weird sexuality classes where like you know like circumcision and stuff like that, and just like teaching people like to be clean, you know, which I do understand. Back in their time, like yeah, that was really you know they didn't have as much good uh, health care system like we do. So maybe those things were beneficial in that time, you know. So that's something that my dad also kind of emphasized, like, oh, if you want to marry a princess, you have to live like a prince, you know. It's, those are like statements I can remember that I had when I was little, like, oh, yeah, it's not like you can just be wild and expect, like, you know, to get this flower. Which is also something that flower I flower meaning a pure woman, basically. Exactly, yeah. I say pure in quotes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Something like that, yeah. Were you a flower, Kara? <laughs> I was a flower. Okay, good I for am you. proud of it too. <laughs> I have so little to live for. All that I was taught, my worth was. So yeah, I was a flower. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Yeah. So yeah, something like that. And also too that I think I appreciate about my day teaching us that his purity was not just about sexuality too. It was also about like things you eat and hence him teaching us how to drink. Like I, I remember him telling us, okay, you are going to start trying to experiment with uh, cigarettes, alcohol, you know, even uh, marijuana, which was not illegal. I mean, in our law, it was illegal, but it has been just part of our lifestyle that you can find it anyway. It's not really hard to find. So he would sit us down and tell us those things, you know. So then he would explain to us, like, okay, so drinking, you have to know when to stop. 
right? Because if you don't, then when people tell you like, oh yeah, they are, someone is addicted to alcohol, they are not lying. You know, it's because you've been like beating up your body too much doing this stuff. Like, yeah, drugs are fine for euphoria feeling and stuff like that. You have to stop there. You don't have to rely on them, you know, which is something that I do not understand how he came to that point because I do not remember, I mean, culturally people teaching that, like that limit because beer was something people generally just drank until they drop you know like they did not have that limit so i i do not understand how he uh, he how he came to that approach of teaching us that so part of yeah part of um uh, of what i meant by that uh purity is you know related to that sexuality and okay. things thank like you it, yeah. thank you for sharing that yeah. yeah it sounds like traditional zimbabwean culture would be experiences very compatible with conservative Orthodox Mormonism. That's what I'm. Yes. Yeah. It yeah. Sound, feel very familiar. And if you had that Christian element, then mm -hmm. you're you're ready for. for yeah. Right on par. <laughs> and yeah. isn't like being in the LGBTQ population is that like kind of illegal in Zimbabwe? Yeah, I would say culturally it's not supported at all. Like people do not do not entertain that culturally. So that's like something that is. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say like it's taught per se, but everyone just kind of understands that it's a taboo, mm -hmm. you know? So it's such that like, just like recent days, that's when these conversations have actually started to happen, you know, like people trying to understand why it's a problem, you know? But culturally, I cannot really like explain why they were against it, you know? Like there is no explanation. It's just like, that's not how things work. You know, so that's like crazy conservative too. Like how, what our culture is like, is like there are certain rules that are just rules, but they are not explained because no one is ever like sit us down and explain to us like why that is wrong. You know, yeah. it's always like, this is how we created men and women. That's it. So let's not, let's not, let's not entertain that idea of people, you know, <laughs> being fluid or anything. So yeah. Is it that's, illegal or punished? Punishable by law? I'm not sure if they have like actual laws right okay. now, but I know that our previous uh, president, he was very vocal about it. Like he, he has many, many like speeches that he has talked about it and he does not entertain that idea. And I remember him getting in trouble one time um, uh, with a human rights activist because there was a time when uh, it was, I think it was like in the 2000s when things started changing and they're like men were braiding their hair and, you know, piercing their ears and stuff. And he equated that is like recolonization. And it's like, okay, these ideas you guys are borrowing are from the West. And the West is kind of recolonizing us. So we're not going to entertain that. And there are instances where he has sent like the police or, you know, soldiers to like, gay functions and gay bars and they will beat out people, you know, to such an extent that he instilled, like he instilled fear in anyone who wanna practice homosexuality, you know, people, like he kind of made it normal. You can beat up a gay person, nothing's gonna happen to you. Mm. You know, you can, you can publicly shame them. There are no repercussions for you doing that, you wow. know. So that I know, like that was his mentality, but I don't, I don't know if he actually has laws, you know. But I know that they cannot get married in Zimbabwe, you know. That, Even now, I don't think so. Okay, yeah, I don't think you, have, we, you can get married if you're yeah. gay in Zimbabwe. Yeah. So yeah, which is something that is not even it just existed in our culture before it just, it, those relationships were not entertained. Right. If they happened, they were just like underground relationship. No sure. one, no one knew about them because yeah, we were just told like, no, nope, it's not going to happen. Fascinating. Yeah. Also very compatible with Orthodox Mormonism. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. So, All right. So take us to, take us to the point of you thinking about the church. Okay. So now, mm -hmm. uh, graduate college, I get an opportunity to, to come to the United States. Oh, what was your perception of the United States as someone growing up in Zimbabwe? What year would this have been where you were thinking about coming to the United States? And when you thought of the United States, what did you think? So my story is kind of funny in a way because I never thought of leaving Zimbabwe at all. And my opportunity came this way. One of my lecturers actually started uh, from uh, the same college I, I came to into the state. So after graduation, I was kind of just like buddy buddies with him, 
you know. And then after graduation, I was a temporal teacher, you know, just figuring out what am I going to do next with my career. And it happened that a professor from his previous college was looking for graduate students that he had a similar uh, research as his lab was doing. And so my final year dissertation kind of aligned with his work. So he was like, oh, I know of this kid who graduated here and he was kind of doing similar work as what you want to research in. I can connect him to you. So this was just like me going about my day teaching and then he sent me a message and he's like, hey, do you have a, a, a resume? I mean, back home we call them CVs. Do you have a CV? And I was like, sure, uh, what's up? And he's just like, send it to me. So I did send it to him, but I did not, I knew maybe he's an opportunity like a teaching assistant at the college or something. I was like, okay, that's, that'll be cool. So I sent it to him. And then two weeks passed, and I was like, I ignored him. I was like, I, I, I don't know. Maybe the opportunity did not work out. And then later on, I received an email from someone from the United States with like a bunch of people copied on it. And he's like, hey, I do really love the work you're doing. Uh, do you mind like filling out this paperwork if you are interested? Like the, uh, so he kind of introduced himself and he talked about what he what he's doing and things like that. And I remember I forwarded that email to my sister, and I was like, "Look at this!" And she's like, "It's a scam." <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So I did not respond yeah. for like five days, huh. and then my lecturer called me and he's like, "Dude, <laughs> why didn't you respond to him?" And I was like, "Wait." Was the, that's real? Yeah, and he's like, yeah, it's real. Fill out that paper, you can send it to him. <laughs> and so that's how I got that opportunity. But in my mind, I never assumed like, oh, oh okay. one day I want to go to the States. Okay. but it's like a reverse Nigerian print scam. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. <laughs> so, yeah, so the, yeah, so he started telling me how my school was going to get paid for and things like that. And I, I took it to my dad and I was like, dad, look at this. And he's like, this is a good opportunity, take it. So I did, I took it. But if you were asking the image of the United States we I had at that point, everyone thinks like, you know, the States is the paradise. Like that's, that's what, that's what life on earth should be like, you know. Also because, think that here. Yeah, because <laughs> everyone, when you, if you say United States uh, to someone in Zimbabwe, they're gonna tell you New York, Chicago, you know all these like Hollywood kind of lifestyle when everyone is just like living in this big city in their fancy apartment and your job just like pays for everything. You can buy a car, you know, you can become anything. You can release a song and you are on MTV and stuff like that. <laughs> That's literally like how people think it works. So to me, coming to... Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That's, that's where you went. That's where I went. Which I did not even know how to say Milwaukee when I <laughs> when I was filling out my application and submitted. So my brother visited me the last week that I was in Zoom. So this is like a funny story. We were at a bar and he's talking like, Oh dude, like this is so amazing. You're gonna go to the States. And I'm like, I know, like who would have thought like I would I would be the one going there. So he's like, So which place are you going to? <laughs> And I said, uh, it's some city called uh, Milwaukee. <laughs> and he's like, where is that? And I was like, I don't know, it's some place called Wisconsin, I guess. And he's like, I've never heard of it. And I was like, me too. <laughs> because obviously, like, the, the kind of content we're exposed to about the United States, they don't talk about places like that, you know. Yeah. They just talk about big it's not cities. A highlight. <laughs> yeah. States that you know, there are people who think Chicago is a state, you know, because <laughs> of how much they hear about it. So... The only, I would say like states that people get right are California. Pretty much that's it, you know. So that's how I was like, yeah, I've never heard of anyone talk about this place. <laughs> Funny thing, you know the beer from Milwaukee, the MGD, Milwaukee Genuine Draft? Yeah. So we have that in Zimbabwe. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So there was a giant poster of MGD. It's in like KFC instead of, M right? Yeah. It's, yes. it's like the initials. <laughs> exactly. from learning what... Yeah. yeah. So everyone just says like, yeah, draft beer, draft beer, draft beer. And we had a giant poster right in front of us <laughs> whilst we were talking that. With the M. With the yeah. yeah. So I remember I was kind of like tipsy at that point. And I remember reading that poster and I was like, oh, 
dude, <laughs> look, he says Milwaukee. <laughs> and he's like, that's where you're going. Oh. And I was like, yeah, that's where this beer is from. And we're like celebrating in the bar, but I did not have an idea what Milwaukee looked like. So then I came to Milwaukee and it was a shocker. And I, I remember uh, texting my brother. I'm like, dude, this place, like the campus looks amazing. But outside of the campus, <laughs> it does not look like these days, man. Like it, <laughs> it, uh, I don't know. Like I could not explain it to him, you know. And also the idea of segregated cities, I was not familiar to it. So I started learning about Milwaukee and I was like, oh, wow, this is not exactly what I thought it was. I was imagining myself like our campus is in the middle of this giant city and I'm taking this train to to the campus or something. You know, stuff you see in movies, you know, or I'm taking my yellow cab, you know, going to campus and back and forth and stuff like that. But it didn't happen. So that was a shocker to me when I came here. So my professor... Uh, let, me, let me ask you really quickly. Socioeconomically, like obviously there's massive variability in terms of socioeconomic status in uh -huh. Africa and probably in Zimbabwe. What, in terms of your socioeconomic upbringing, did you guys have a car? I'm assuming you had electricity and, you know, just what was your style of living and what would, you know, how would it have been different from Milwaukee or similar to yeah. Milwaukee? Just so we can get a baseline yeah. of what you grew up with. So, yeah, I would say my, the majority of uh, the country in Zimbabwe, I don't know how now it is like, but growing up, we did not have electricity where, where I grew up. In your house? Yeah, in my house. No, no electricity? No, we would use uh, uh, paraffin can, uh, lamps, which is basically is like a bottle of uh, kerosene. Okay. And then, you know, that way our lamps. Whoa. Yeah. So imagine me hearing plumbing, this. Indoor plumbing? Nope. We have what are called uh, blade, to blade toilets, which are basically outside. Like, you know what I mean? Like they would dig a, a pit and then they'll build a structure on top of that pit with all the ventilation system and everything. So you go to the bathroom outside of the house, you know. How would you get water? We, had, we would go to either streams and... By that time, the government started drilling uh, boreholes, which are basically like a manual pump that you manually pump water from the ground. That's how we got like clean, clean, clean drinking water. So, who would have brought the water from the well to your house growing that, up? That's us. That's the kids. That was our chores. You, like later in the day, you take your containers, you run to the well or the bowl or the stream. You fetch the water, you bring it back home, and you fill your storage containers. So we would separate our water. So there was a drinking water, especially because some bowls will run dry, you know, during dry seasons. So the community would ration the water. But like, okay, bowl water is safe for drinking. So that's cooking and drinking water only. In certain cases, they would allow like 40 liters per family, you know, for drinking and cooking. So we would do that, go to the well, fetch the water, bring it home, fill it up in, in your reservoir containers, and then you go to the stream for water for bathing and things like that. So you fill it up, it, uh, uh, like say from 4 p.m. until dinner, and then you cook your dinner such that in the morning when you wake up and you're going to school, you don't have to go to the stream. You can uh, take a, a, a bath from your bucket that you brought in last night, then you go to school. Otherwise, if you try to do that in the morning, you're going to be late, right? And school started at 7 a.m., and we had to walk to that school anyway, you know. So, so the idea of a hot shower or a hot bath? No, that did not occur to us. So to give you like a, a glimpse of how you would have a warm bath, is like you have a bucket of water, right? So we had like little, we should pretty much like uh, paint tins, you know, used paint tins. So you would put half of your water in that paint tin, put it on, on, on fire, Literally a fire. You, if you, a fire, like with firewood, you know, then you will heat up, then you will transfer it to the rest of your bucket. You have warm water, then you take a shower. In the buck in the bucket. In the bucket, yeah. Okay. So And so who would be collecting the who would collect the wood and who would make the fire? Oh, that's us still. <laughs> so <laughs> so this is ding ding ding. Yeah, so that's how like di division of labor culturally was because that's pretty much close to how people lived, you know, back in the day, they did not have electricity or anything. So you'd see that women and children will go gather firewood, then men will go hunting, right? So they will bring the meat, then we have the firewood and we have the water. 
So then we will make a meal, you know, and then we would still uh, cultivate our own corn. We, the staple food in Zimbabwe is called sadza, which is basically is a corn paste, you know, which you can eat with any relish, be it uh, roasted meat or stew, vegetables or anything you can eat with it. So that's pretty much our traditional staple food. So did you grow your own corn? Yes, we did. Yeah. So you had subsistence level farming Yes, where you would grow the food you ate. Yes. So pretty much every, every house would look like this. You have your house and around your house, you cultivate, you cultivate the crops that you need uh, to, to, to eat. So you have corn, you have your tomatoes, ground nuts and stuff like that. People like, it's really normal in Zimbabwe to have a plot of land that you cultivate to get corn and stuff food that you can eat. So that was pretty much my childhood is. And what about, what about livestock, like chickens or goats or a animals, cows? Yeah. Any, did you have that? We did. So my uh, grandpa, my dad's dad, he actually had a farm. So he had, we had plenty of that. We had takeys, goats, cows, chicken, you know. It, some people even kept uh, pigeons and uh, rabbits or something like that. So we, we do a lot of animal rearing in Zimbabwe. So you would kill the animals and then cut right. cut them up and eat them. Yep. Right? That's pretty much what yeah, I mean, this is, so like in terms of socioeconomic standard of living, that's kind of like 19th century America. I mean, this is reminding me of kind of like Little House in the Prairie mm -hmm. kind of level subsistence. And it sounds like as far as education goes, you guys were as educated or better as, as kids growing up in the United States. So it's just because the standard of living might have been very different. I, I'm, you know, super smart and educated. So that that's so it's an interesting disparity. Yeah. Well, and especially like your your parents, how much they valued education and how much they sacrificed to send you to boarding schools. I mean, that wasn't yeah. normal, right? Yeah, yeah. Not not everybody went to boarding schools. Like going to a boarding school was kind of like privilege. Yeah, a privilege and like a, quite a good status in the community. Like, oh your son goes to a boarding school, you know. So yeah, going back to your question you were asking, so pretty much like you our lifestyle growing up, that division of labor was like pretty normal to us. Like it's like, yeah, yeah, I am I'm the kid. I'm gonna go fetch water, I'm gonna gather firewood and I wanna start the fire. So when my mom comes in and she wants to make a meal, the fire's already going. And in the morning too, it's your responsibility if you want to have a warm bath to start the fire in the morning because no one else was going to do that for you, right? So we'd wake up, start the fire. We already have the water from yesterday. Then voila, warm bath. <laughs> so that's pretty much how uh, my most of my childhood was like. But then we moved to a place that had electricity. So that's pretty much, the electricity was just like using it for cooking and lighting pretty much most of the time. So it's still no plumbing, still outside bathroom. So the easiest part about that is, well, maybe now we can heat up our water without lighting up a fire, right? So, and we can cook cleaner inside the house without cooking outside because, um, the other house we lived in, we had to cook outside because, I mean, it's a fire, you know, there's smoke and everything. So we would cook outside and bring the food inside. So that was like an upgrade. Like, okay, now we can cook inside <laughs> the house. Up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and in the morning, I can just turn on a heating element and I will have warm water inside my bucket, you know. Talk about you watching your little TV. Yeah, I was going to ask about internet too. So TV and internet? Yeah, we did not have internet. We watched like, uh, I don't know how, what they call it, just like when you put up your antenna outside and then you watch the yeah. government broadcast, you know, station. Now how how old are you right now? So it that no, no right now, right now, today. Right, oh today. Today I'm turning thirty one. I'm turning thirty one. Yeah, I'm turning thirty one. Yeah. So this would have been, you know, uh ten fifteen years ago. We're talking about fifteen years ago. Yeah, or more, yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah, so we did not have a lot of entertainment options, we watched whatever they broadcasted, right? And we had black and white televisions back then. Like having a color television was like, wow, where did you guys get that? You know, it wasn't as common to have a color television. And also TV sets were not as common in households because again, most people did not have electricity. So you wouldn't even 
wow. heavy. You know, people hate radios. You know, that was very common because <laughs> they would buy batteries and stuff, and then they like little, uh, little boom boxes or whatever. I can call them like that would listen to the radio stations, and we had more variety listening to the radio. Anyway, I think at that point we had four radio stations because it was like radio one, two, three, and four. You know, I mean, I, it almost sounds like you went from kind of 19th century so socioeconomic status to like 1950s and 60s, mm -hmm. just within a few years. That's yeah. a rapid advancement. Yeah. yeah. And, and by the way, Africa is set to like, as I understand it, quadruple in its population over the next 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. So Africa is on the rise in a very significant way. So they're they may have been behind in some ways, but they're going to be catching up very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most economists, as I understand it, are projecting Africa to become a major global center within the next several decades. Yeah. So, I mean, it's and it's cool to see you guys are able to advance so quickly. I yeah, guess. that's true. So the funny thing about that, too, is like in that same in that same time I am living like that, someone who was living in the city like Harare is living a totally different lifestyle. Right. Because they have electricity, they have plumb plumbing, they are not looking for firewood, they are not ha they're not having the same struggles as I am, you know? Yeah. So you find that if you talk to someone my age who did not grow up in the part of the country okay. I grew up, they sense. will tell you a totally different story. Like, oh well, yeah, I mean- Well, even your you know, college experience still in Zim was different. You still had a laptop. You were watching American television. Yeah, it was an upgrade. College was an it upgrade. It was an upgrade, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of things to it that um, I, I, was, I used to tell Mackenzie too. Is like, okay, when we're in college, now we are now using internet. We watched a lot of shows, American shows, than pretty much an average American or someone. Because we, we, we now have access to these like sites that are pirating stuff from here, right? Yeah. And we are watching movie after movie, show after movie, we are downloading them on our laptops and stuff, you know what I mean? So it's it's like in the same country, you can have people who are living in different time frames and it's like a giant bracket. No, it's almost like you went from 19th century socioeconomic status to 21st socio century socioeconomic status mm -hmm. in a period of like four or five years. That's, yeah. that's kind of interesting that you got to experience that wide range of different yeah. st styles of living. It's interesting. Yeah. So I'm curious, once you arrive in Milwaukee, I would, my, my American bias would say it would, even though in America I've been, I've been to Milwaukee, like, you know, there are rundown urban centers that feel from United States standards to be very like, uh, look, socioeconomically kind of lower status, high crime, yeah. um, uh, higher levels of poverty here by today's standards, I would wonder whether Milwaukee might still feel like an upgrade coming from Zimbabwe to you. But you're saying it 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 felt problematic in some ways? Or? Yeah, I would say part of it is like expectation versus reality, right? So someone is, is telling me, is like, okay, so when you move to these place, this is what you're going to see. Even though you are living a life that is way worse than that, but like you're walking into this uh, environment expecting crazy advanced society where like everyone is, is living in this beautiful mansion and, and things like that. And then boom, like you see this other side of America that you are not taught at all. And you don't know how to live that. You know, you're just like, Okay, because I remember thinking to myself, uh, walking in one uh, neighborhood in Milwaukee, I think uh, it's like the 35th area or, or something. That's pretty much things that you see in those kind of uh, rap videos people do not watch because it's some underground artist guy with the, two of his friends with a digital camera <laughs> and they're just like filming this, this uh, you know, run down residential area and you know, people are sitting on their pouch wearing wife beaters or shirtless and things like that. So walking in that environment is not what my mind expected America to be. You know what I mean? So still, even though I'm getting the pics that I did not live before, at the same time, there's this sense of like shock, like, wait, how come nobody talks about this this thing, like how come this is real? Because I've never thought like I would walk up to a neighborhood where I see that and it's actually real. Like, yeah, 
you see someone asking you for a dollar in America, <laughs> like that was never something that Got it. people would tell you like, oh yeah, they're homeless people in America. Nobody says something like that. So seeing people in a line at like a, a church because they want to spend that night still kind of bothered me because I was like, I don't understand how this works. Like I'm a foreigner, I have an apartment, even though it's not what I expected. There is someone who was born here who is living this life that if I go back to Zimbabwe, this person will have their heart. You know what I mean? They have their little, their little building, they call a home, you know, no matter how small it is, they they're will have homeless. that. They're yeah, not they are not gonna sleep at the street. Oh. You know what I mean? So that's, that's what I was like, back home we had what we called street kids which way kids like that will like go to the city and hang out in the streets, you know what I mean? Some of them will go home at night, you know, very few of them were homeless to such an extent that they would sleep on the street. So it wasn't like a really first world idea to see someone who says, yeah, literally like I don't have anywhere to spend the night tonight. Our toilets are outside, but we still have toilets. <laughs> exactly. You know, I was home. like, yeah, we still, we still have those, uh, I'm um, Nietzsche, if you call it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that that was that was uh something I was really surprised to see, you know. And also that uh, the idea that uh, gunshots are normal sounds to hear and no one takes cover or anything, just like, oh, who read it on the news? Or like who who hear about it. So my first time <laughs> walking down there and I thought I heard something. But I was like, ah, I don't know what, what, what it is. And then I went home and there it was when Wisconsin 12, yeah, two people were shot. And I was like, I know that street. Like that's literally the 7-Eleven, I was it. So that was also something that the movies we watch now, big home, they portray that lifestyle is as, as if like, oh, these are places that like the government is trying to fix like, and they are very rare. Like you, it's not a normal life. This is like something you will not, see if you come to America. So me being exposed to that, I was like, uh, I don't know, I don't know what Milwaukee is, but I don't like it at this <laughs> moment. Like, I don't think like this is the first world I was imagining. And people like telling me things like, hey, when you come out of the library at night, like don't wear a hoodie. And I was like, why wouldn't I? Because that's, that's those are the cool people we see on the television, right? <laughs> like the way their flat bed cases, caps and they have woodies. Why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I want to look like that? You know, because come on, it's America, right? But they're like, nah, <laughs> it is, but kind of like it's not, you know. It's not safe. It's not safe. Yeah, it's not safe. Of color exactly. In the United States. Yeah. And that took me a while to actually understand what they were saying to me, you know. Actually, I, uh, I did understand that after I left Milwaukee's when I was like, wait. So this is what this means. Like, oh yeah, you can be mistaken for someone. You can, you know what I mean? And uh, I remember telling my kids this after a few of things happened and I was like, you know what? There are times when I would walk home and I would see the public safety car behind me, you know, like kind of bowling behind me, you know. Oh, like police. Yeah. <laughs> and like they would kind of like observe me for a little bit. But because I'm a student, it never okay to me, you know, like what that can turn out to be. I was just like, yeah, it's public safety, right? Probably they know I'm a student. They're just walking you home. Yeah, they're just like walking me home, you know? But it was driving while black. They saw that you were a person of color. And exactly. They're, they're scoping it, you out, profiling you, potentially yeah. to pull you over. So I did not even, <laughs> that did not even happen to me because I have this idea of, how beautiful, good, <laughs> civilized, advanced this place is, right? So even if I'm coming in big home, like the police are good people, right? Like I never assume like, oh yeah, you can have an interaction with the police where you can die. Like it was never like an idea that I would like think for myself. So seeing that here was kind of, it made me uncomfortable, I would say, even though I'm like, okay, it's like you're trading pecs, you know, they're like, okay, so you can live in this place where you can you can do whatever you want. You can build your house, live however you want. We're not gonna talk to you, right? But you're not gonna have plumbing. You have to fetch your own water, blah, blah, blah. You don't have a perfect health care system, you know, like it's, it's run down or whatever. Versus, okay, watch your bag every time, but then you get an apartment with running water and stuff, you know? So I feel like 
is this a trade? Am I trading, you know, something that I've enjoyed my entire life because I've never questioned the police before. I've never, I felt safe around them. But then you, you go into this environment where everyone is like, yeah, actually people will look like you, you have to be careful when you interact. I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? So that was a shocker to me being exposed to that versus what I was expecting coming from from home. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're, there, there's not just two Americas, but there's lots of Americas. But what I hear you describing is the disparity between the Hollywood mm-hmm. public image of America versus the fact that there are parts of America where the mortality rate of children is higher than in many African countries. Yeah. Where, where the levels of crime and poverty and homelessness exceeds many, many African countries. Yeah. But... You know, so we have a real problem of disparity of wealth yeah. in the United States and of poverty and of injustice that isn't communicated in our media always. Right? That's true. Yeah. yeah. And you were shocked. Well, and I've even have that. I've even had members mm-hmm. of my own family asking him, like, so is back home like the inner cities here? Like that's their view of of his home. Yeah. Is you know. that level of poverty and crime and Yeah. And you talk about uh, you talk about uh, seg- racial segregation in Americans' urban cities. I guess you wouldn't have experienced a lot of segregation in Zimbabwe because pretty much everyone, most people there are people of color, so there wouldn't yeah. even be enough racial diversity to have s- racial segregation. Or I don't want to make assumptions. I know that South Africa is yeah. very different than Zimbabwe. Yeah, but is that why you would not have experienced racial segregation? Yeah, I did. I did understood the idea of segregation, but the way I landed in Zimbabwe it was like, you know, during the time we were colonized, right? Yeah, it existed where black people were not allowed in certain mm-hmm. streets, black people were not allowed in certain neighborhoods, right? Then I read it in books, and that was part of my school curriculum, but I never actually lived it. You know, I remember like walking down Fifth Street with my dad, and he's like telling me, like, you know, we you, you we, we used to need a permit. <laughs> for us to walk down this street, you know? Some of the effects, you can still see them. If you go back to Zimbabwe, you will see like, they are beautiful neighbors that you see. They were pretty, they were like white neighbors, you know? So I never really lived it. But I would say, so black people being segregated from white people was kind of like a normal idea to me, even though I did not live it. I'm as familiar with it. But the difference uh, between that and America is, in America, there's not just a white man and a black man. They, it's like a spectrum of brown people all the way to white people, right? So in a city like Milwaukee now, I remember I observed it myself before I even like read about it. It's like there are Hispanics on one side and there are like black people on one side and there are neighbors in Milwaukee that literally people will tell you like, don't go there if you're black, you know, like don't go there. And I, I never visited those places because the bus doesn't even go there, right? So mm. then later on, just like realizing like, wait a second, I know big home, like I, we are not as diverse as here, but I've seen Indian people big home, right? And I, I couldn't really pinpoint a situation where like we were like separating ourselves from them, right? So it kind of felt weird to me that even like black people get segregated from Hispanics, get segregated from Indians, even though in any other part of the world, we are pretty much kind of like the same people, you know, like there's some, there's not, there's nothing like that. So that was a shocker to me too, when I was like, okay. And everyone in Milwaukee is like, they have like a, a German background or something, you know? And the fact that I, I thought <laughs> since like, people who are growing up with, at these farms, as dairy farms, they might probably like not have that mentality, you know, because back home, white people who owned farms befriended people of color because they needed labor, right? So there was not exactly segregation. Yeah, they stayed in a farmhouse. That was not part of the compounds, you know what I mean? But it was like a structure you can explain if you walk into it. You can be like, oh yeah, I understand. Yeah, that's the farmer. These are the workers, right? But in that scenario, me seeing that, I couldn't explain that. You know, like my mind couldn't comprehend why Hispanics are in one corner, why black people are in one corner, why Indians are in one corner, and why 
everyone else is somewhere that we are not allowed to go, you know. So that white people basically. Yeah, yeah exactly. So yeah. and also like heavy police presence is also something that I I thought it was normal at first because I was like, oh yeah, big home, our police doesn't everyone is not sitting in their own car or something like that. So you don't really just see them roaming around, you know. But then <laughs> I remember coming out of uh, our lab at night one day because we had a uh, public safety uh, department, right, which was mainly like patrolling the campus. Then you have the Milwaukee police. And I remember seeing him and something in my mind was just like, ha, I wonder like why does this, because we, um, uh, at my college in Zimbabwe, we had uh, security, right, at the campus. They did not look like that. You know, like they were not beefed up armed and, you know, looking like um, he might end a SWAT situation at any point. You know what I mean? And I just like remember asking myself, like, why does it look like that? Because they would also patrol our buildings and like, check doors if they're logged in, some, something like that. You know, and being a PhD student, like you spend time in the lab and like you go home late at night. So I would see them, you know, and they would just be like, oh, hi, bud. Uh, where are you coming from? And things like that. And I would just talk to them because I thought like, it's a normal conversation, right? Like he wants to know how my day is going. You know, but it's not like that, you know. And uh, I just remember asking myself, like, why does it look like that? Like, this seems excessive. Like, you are in a school building, you know, pretty much everyone uses the ID to scan and come in. Like, why do you need to come in here, you know, with like a bat on guns, blah, 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 and this giant vest, you know. But I was just like, oh, well, it's America, you know, like they have these things, so they use it, right? <laughs> they can access a bulletproof, so why not wear it, right? But then as time goes on and like being exposed to things that are happening around me, and, oh, a light bulb went into my head when I read like one of like the activist emails and it's like, we need to demilitarize our school security. And I was like, what does, what do they mean demilitarize? Because coming from Africa, if someone says demilitarize, I would assume maybe they have tanks, you know, because <laughs> to us, that's what militarization has been portrayed. It was just like, yeah, these people are like wearing these, you know, better of you would stand. And I was like, okay, I don't know what they're talking about, you know. But then I started reading about it and I was like, oh, okay. So now it makes sense why I had that simple question in my head. I was like, oh, why does it look like this in the hallway? You know, that's what they were talking about, right? So yeah, that, that were like a few things that I can say that, they stood out to me in a weird way that there are things that my home cannot afford, but at the same time, here they are being, people can afford to do that, but it seems like it's in the wrong place. So it still kind of seemed weird to me, right? So anyway. Fascinating. Yeah, I I just have to say that um, as, a, as, a, as a white person in America with privilege, my base setting of thinking about America is like, oh, anyone can go anywhere and everyone's safe and everything's equal. And But that's privilege because if I really think about it, yes, neighborhoods are completely segregated by race. Mm -hmm. And this idea of like you being told by people around you don't go into the white neighborhoods, I would never experience that as a white American because I would never be told something like that. In fact, I would probably be told the opposite. Don't go into the I mean, we don't have those types of neighborhoods so much in Utah, but if I'm thinking about Chicago or it's like, don't go into those neighborhoods, Yeah. but right. for a different reason, not because I would be perceived as unsafe, but because, you know, I might get hurt, yeah. but, but right. we are way more segregated than we understand as people of privilege in the yeah. United States. Mm -hmm. And it's really valuable to hear you talk about that because- yeah it's got to be really disorienting for you and it just shows ignorance and privilege for me to realize how racially segregated and how much economic and social disparity and injustice there is in the United States. Yeah. But as a person of privilege, you don't even have to worry about it. Yeah. You just, you just, you're white. You get to do whatever you want, whatever you want. Right. You know what I mean? Nobody yeah. would understand that until they, yeah, they tried they to understand it. or try to listen to someone else who's experienced 
But yeah, I don't think I mean, of America that way. Do you understand what I'm saying, Kara? Yeah. Like, yeah. It, in my privileged mind, I, I, oh, America's great. It's land of the free, home of the brave. <laughs> it's safe for everybody. You know what yeah, I'm saying? It makes me think of that Louis C.K. joke where he's like, I could go to the year two, and I don't know what's happening in the year two, but as soon as I get out of a time machine, oh, I'm a white man. Here's a table right here for you. <laughs> and he's like, black people do not want to F with time machines. Anytime before 1980, they're like, no, 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 I don't want to go there. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, it takes it takes good satire and good comedians, I think, to help make those bridges and connections for people. People like me, at least. So yeah. Yeah, that's where my that's mind true. goes. Well, I, I, you know, it's not your job to educate us, but I really appreciate that you are yeah. Yeah, willing yeah. to help us understand a little bit about what it might be like for some to be a person of color in the United States. Yeah. I mean, another thing too, I, I would like to add just like for maybe I'm pretty sure you have a, a bunch of like Africans people listening to your podcast. Like this, this side of that story that is never taught. Right. So for me, coming here and interacting with other black people, I realized that, you know, I do not relate to America the same way they do. So there's always like, uh, I remember going to a bar at one time and uh, we were playing pool, right? And this guy asked me where I'm from. Then I told you, and he said something like, oh, so you are African, huh? And I said, yeah. And he said, you go to market? And I said, yeah, I do. And things kind of, you know, changed in a way because because of this system we have, it has uh, made other uh, African-Americans here believe that Africans can relate to white people and white people like Africans, you know. But I'm walking in this situation not knowing that. And, yeah, it might be true. Because I uh, I remember telling my kids an incident that I had with my African American friend when we got pulled over, right? And then the officer said, uh, "Can I, they, he took the driver's license of the person who was driving, right? And then he asked me for my identification, and I just whipped it out and gave it to him. And my friend was sitting in the back and he's like, "You don't you don't need to give him that, you know?" And I was like, "Why?" Why wouldn't I? Like, I mean, he's an officer, you know? And he's like, yeah, he, he didn't do anything. If anything, like, he should talk to the driver, you know? So the fact that I am agreeing to his actions because I do not understand what that can mean to people of color being put over, right? And him trying to educate me in that instance, like, no, this is not how it works, right? Kind of, like, created a conflict between us. And it justified how he felt towards me. It's like, yeah, this is exactly what I was saying. Like, you guys, you are nice. You you kind of like them. And I'm like, no, I. it's not like I like them. I do not understand or relate to the like your experience that you've had here. Because mind you, I just came here, right? So I don't even know of uh, people being profiled. I don't even know about what happens when you get pulled over and something like that. So I'm kind of like naive in a sense, you know. But then... This happens too when, like, the officers, the moment they realize, like, oh, he's a student at Marquette, right? And most likely with his accent, he's not from here. They they would talk nicer to me, mm. right? You know? So now they're kind of, like, justifying Reinforcing him. what your yeah. friend just said. So my friend now is hostile in that scenario because me and the officer can talk nicely, right? He can be like, yeah. You can have a you can have a good night, say right? Then he give it to me, right? Then he asks he ask him his and he says no. So now it's two versus one, right? Two black guys gave me the identification, no problem. Why are the one who's saying no, right? So I am putting him in a weird position because I do not relate to his experience, you know. And yeah, things can get worse for him, and I don't know that. So you will find that like it's a very common thing for African Americans here to be careful when they interact with us because most of us most of us from Africa we do not understand exactly how it is here you know and what it means with certain actions what they mean to me they don't mean anything because i don't know a previous story that like resulted in someone losing their life you know i'm just like okay it's authority right so here's my here's my license i didn't do anything wrong or something like that so it's also like a side of that story that 
Oh man. Most people do not get to hear, but it happens in our communities where like people are like, "Oh yeah, yeah, Africans are so disciplined." But we are it's not because we're disciplined, it's because we do not have certain information, you know, and certain exposure to those things. So, it's something I was trying to explain to my brother and he also struggled understanding it, you know. He's like, "Why why wouldn't he just give it to him?" You know? And I did not even understand the fact that like people here like you have a record and it can be run anytime it can be used against you when you are not even aware of it to me i did not think like that i was like yeah i don't know maybe he's gonna document it somewhere that he pulls you over and the next time you do something then it's like kind of like a second offense that you are not aware of or something like that it did not even occur to me in that scenario that giving him our ideas and him going to his car he can document it and you know what i mean whether there's something wrong or whether there's nothing you know nothing yeah. wrong it can be used against us next time it's like yeah you guys you were in downtown at 2 a.m this day blah 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 and then it makes us look like we have a certain lifestyle that we do not have and it took me years and years until i actually like started going back to those experiences with other black people where i'm like oh now it makes sense why someone will be kind of pissed at me for befriending that officer who is doing extra to us in a way that is kind of like profiling us but in that moment coming from africa oh yeah i am happy like i don't interact with police that much like so if i if i interact with him and i feel like i did not do anything wrong you know i don't yeah. think i don't think anything worse about him so i'm just like yeah you can have it i mean i'm just sitting in a passenger seat what are you going to say yeah. you know so yeah it's one of i can't i cannot imagine if i were a us citizen person of color raised here to see a foreign national of the same skin color get treated better than me because I was raised here and because of whatever prejudices and biases yeah. are carried because of a person of color raised in the United States. I, I would, I, I'm sure there's a name for this. Yeah. <laughs> I've never really thought it makes sense to me now just because of prejudice, yeah. like a, a person of color raised in a, you know, a, a lower socioeconomic status. I could see why there would be prejudice against them here mm -hmm. because they associate crime which is associated with poverty and and danger or whatever but that that bigotry would just be so disheartening for me and yeah. that's as a US common. citizen and and it would yeah. be hard for you to be caught up in that cuz you're just here to try and get an education <laughs> like yeah. it's awful all the way around and i didn't even i didn't, i had no idea until I met you and you talked to me about your experience in the black community <clears throat> in Wisconsin and how that was pretty widespread. I mean, it was like black Americans versus African American or Africans yeah, African, in a lot yeah. of ways. And even just like the ideas of slavery and black Americans blaming Africans for allowing slavery to occur, you know? So it's just the idea that it's been so separated and that there's not even a given community here with people that look like you and have the same ancestry, right? Yeah. But there's these perceptions and these misunderstandings and even these these black Americans, maybe they haven't been racially profiled in every instance, but they've been raised by parents that have and have taught them how to interact with the police, how to deal with this, you know, and and coming from a country where that's never even been a discussion, yeah. you're just at such a disadvantage and that just reinforces everything that these black Americans think about Africans and, oh, you're here, you've had the privilege to come to the United States. You're obviously rich enough and you're smart enough to be here when they don't, they don't know where you came from and your story yeah. and your experience. So it's, it's complicated and it's, it's it really is, yeah. sad that, that that happens. I remember, I remember when Barack Obama was running for president or became president, I remember Stephen Colbert interviewing a, a woman of color who is like an academic uh -huh. basically stating that, Af that that Barack Obama wasn't really an African-American uh -huh. because he was raised in white, you know, Hawaii, America, mm -hmm. because he had African ancestry instead of, you know, African-American ancestry mm -hmm. because he didn't have a speech pattern that would be associated with kind of, you know, uh, being raised as a African-American in yeah. the United States. Right. That he, it, it wasn't necessarily the victory for um, people of color in the United States that they would have 
ultimately like to see because he really didn't represent them Mm -hmm. in speech. And now it's making more sense to me why people raised as African-Americans would say, well, we're not quite there. Like, yes, it's great that a person of color is president, but he actually doesn't really represent us. And just now I'm making the connections more as to what was meant by that. Because Stephen Colbert kind of makes fun of her a little bit Uh by saying he's not really an African-American. But but now I see why right. that mattered to her and why that probably matters to a lot of people. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, if you, if you came in speaking with an African-American dialect, right. Then they, they would acknowledge that, but yeah. you would speak quote more like a white person. And so for them, you're more, you're European more European or Afro, like not like it's too proper English. Yeah. It's, it's too proper. Also like this is the other thing too, I, I noticed too is like, you know, if you're interacting with someone who is like racist, right? In the moment, like I give it away the moment I open my mouth, right? He, they will hear an accent. So meaning chances are I am not from here. Like if I am this age and I still talk the way I do, I'm probably like really new to what happens here, right? So even like me saying, I remember saying like, oh, uh, police in Utah are really nice. You know, it's something I have said to my friends because I have interacted with them. I have sat in a policeman's car when they had pulled me, pulled me over for speeding, and he was taking me through what the Ascana does when you are on the road, right? So that's an experience I have. I remember him taking me inside, he's like, come here, let me show you something. So when you're driving down the road, this is what I see, this is why I pulled you over, so this is your place, this is your insured, blah, 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 right? Something it's, like a friendly chat. In it's a, a friendly chat. Part. I have committed an offense. I was speeding, right? And then at the end, he write me my ticket and I was like, yeah, I mean, you were doing more than five over, but I'm just gonna write you for, you know, for five. I was just gonna say five, right? So for me, that 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 interaction, I was like, wow, I don't know, like these these guys are like they they are so good, you know. But like going back, I'm like, the moment I started talking, he probably was like, this guy, like, he's very polite. You know, he, he has an accent. He's just like, yeah, yes, say, no, say. And then he's like, okay, cool. He, it's just bias. It's yeah, just, he's, he's biased, right? Yeah. So, and me walking around with that experience and telling other people who literally have had the worst experience with the police, <laughs> like, who validated the same exact point my gang was talking about. It's like, oh, yeah, sure. So, you guys are buddy buddies, right? Like, you, this is the same guy who probably put me over and, like, gave me a ton of hell for something that doesn't even like really matter and you just told me you were speeding yeah, you know yeah, yeah. so I, d- I did realize that after a while I was like oh there's also a form of uh, profiling that I am not aware of the yeah. moment I like start talking you know or, or like how you are dressed and then someone's like eh, he seems proper like yeah. I, I'm not gonna give him any trouble he probably knows a lawyer because he's formally dressed or something you know what I mean yeah, like international <laughs> privilege basically yeah I'm just gonna check in really quick with the audience and with Kara like Kara and I have been talking about like is there a way we can you know we are always a lot of Mormon stories listeners love long form yeah uh-huh. And then, of course, we always get that feedback of like, make it shorter. I can't yeah. watch a five hours, <laughs> eight hour episode. So, Karen and I are always talking about: is there a way to make them shorter, but to still keep them high quality? And so, I'm checking in with my brain and maybe with Karen a little bit. Like, wow, we've taken a lot of time just talking about what it's like to be a person of color in the yeah. United States, and from the. But I'm not, I'm kind of not apologetic about it. Like, none of this has anything to do with Mormonism. I know. I'm like, is and this the right podcast? That we're <laughs> no, but I mean, here? it's. What's more, like we talk about racism and Mormonism, like if we can't talk about racism in the broader culture, Mm -hmm. like I think we're missing something. And you are so generous to be helping us learn more and understand more. I I kind of want to, there's a part of my Mormon podcast brain that's like, sorry, we're talking so much about not Mormon stuff. (laughs) And then it's the sorry, not sorry, because like this is gold for me to help us understand better why we all need to think better and do better as a society. Cause America's got a lot of, there's a lot of like flag waivers are like America, America, love America on Mormon stories. And then there's people that see a lot of problems yeah. and this helps us see the problems. Right. We can still love America and become and it's more because aware we of love problems. America that we want it to be better. Yeah. yeah. You know, if mm-hmm. we didn't care, then we would just leave and try somewhere else, you know? Yeah. And let it burn. But Are you okay, Carrie? You mad at me? 
No, I love. <laughs> I actually, ironically, on the drive over this morning, I was listening to a YouTube video that was an analysis of the movie Borat. Have yeah. you seen Borat? Uh-huh. You love Borat. Absolute favorites. <laughs> and because you would love sponsored Borat. by Mormon stories, <laughs> Borat. Kara would love Borat. If, if anyone would love Borat. It makes sense. It's, uh, yeah. it's yeah. the satire. Yeah. And I think what Sasha Baron Cohen was doing is he was coming to America and kind of trying to highlight the different types of bigotry that exist. And there's more overt and more covert versions. There's like the frat boys who are kind of drunk and being as bigoted as possible. And then there's the more like submissive, nice old lady ones that just think that anyone from a different country is a backwards, completely like doesn't even know how to wipe their own ass, just like right. as stupid as humanly possible. <laughs> and that's kind of what I I didn't realize that this would actually tie into kind of what we're talking about is we're not talking about Mormonism. We're talking about broader cultural ideas that I think a lot of us Americans are raised with of how we view other cultures. Right. And I think what Gerald just um, highlighted is the way that he talked about living in, uh, you know, really meager means without electricity growing Mm -hmm. up and then just slowly advancing. But then you have different struggles when you move to America that there's, it's just, it's just changing around different aspects, but you still have different struggles and the way that American, that we have this exceptionalist view a lot of times that because we have electricity that we're better, but we still have systemic issues that just like every country does, but we still have issues that we need to tackle. So I'm really glad that we're having this discussion. So it highlights a lot of really important things. Thanks for being willing to help us learn more. Yeah, exactly. Enjoy. All right. So you're uh, in Milwaukee. You're at Marquette. Yeah, that's a good school. That's yeah. where Dwayne Wade went, by the way. He's oh, I'm, exactly. an, I'm an NBA fan, and yeah, I was supporting the Miami Heat that time because of him. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What other team would I support? And eventually, <laughs> uh, eventually, Milwaukee won the NBA Finals, right? Yeah. So that that probably elevated Milwaukee's international profile. That's true, and it makes me feel bad because Giannis... I did not support the Bucks, and all of a sudden they had this wonderful journey and won the championship, and I was like, oh man, I could have been a Bucks fan, and I'll be happy right now. <laughs> and even though Giannis is from Greece, yes, but, uh, his 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 ancestors obviously originally. Yeah, they from call Africa. him the Free Greek. Yeah, freak, the Greek freak. freak. Yeah, Greek Greek freak, freak, yeah. And what country, do you remember what country he, Giannis is from? I'm not really sure. Okay. Yeah, man. Okay. I, I, I know him and his brother, like they, yeah. they were always, you know, the crazy Greek Greek boys. All right, so let's 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 <laughs> take us to the point where you uh, are, uh, you know, learning about Mormonism, and we'll, st- we'll stop right there. Yeah, so, yeah, so then um, I had uh, this scenario where, my professor right in Milwaukee didn't turn out to be much of a good person as I thought he was. So I make this decision where I'm like, okay, I need to change schools, right? So I am researching around what kind of scholarships I can get and what kind of schools I can get into. So Cause I'm, you're in grad school at this yeah, point. Yeah, I'm in grad school. So I am like applying to Europe and trying to see which schools can I afford. Cause now at this point, because I was at a scholarship that was paying everything for me, right? Now I'm trying to make a decision where I have to Factor in that I might have to take to incur some of the cost of going to grad school. Then, out of the blues, my friend that we lost conduct when we were, I can't remember, I think we were like 12. That's the last time we actually seen each other. Then, out of the blues, he just messaged me on Facebook. He's like, hey, uh, where you at? And I was like, oh, wow. So we started talking. After a, I don't know, a decade of talking to each other. And then I found out that he is living in Provo, right? And I was like, oh, cool. I am in Milwaukee. And I've been talking to some uh, professor uh, from a school called BYU that is in Provo, Utah. That's where you are. So then I immediately like sent him a, an email and I was like, can I come see your lab and talk to you? You know, and so you can understand better my situation and if I can maybe move you know, from Marquette and transfer to BYU. And he's like, oh, sure. Um, you can come here. I'm on vacation right now, but I'll update you out probably around, I think he said around February, I'll be in Provo. So I was like, okay, awesome. So I planned my trip to come down to Provo to see my friend and then see him. So at this point, even though I know there's a school called BYU, I don't really understand that it's a Mormon school. And my friend who I'm talking to is also Mormon, right? And I don't know this at this point. So I visit him down here and then I was taking trips like to just see BYU, the campus itself. And then 
that's when I kind of like was trying to understand what this school is about, you know. And then I come back home and I was like, hey, can you tell me more about BYU? Like I kind of feel like there is kind of a, a market vibe, you know, because market is a Jesuit school, right? So you pretty much see the Catholic stuff everywhere. And I did see Mormon stuff in BYU. Everybody, I did not know what that was because I don't know what Mormonism is, right? So then he starts like telling me about the church. He's like, "Oh, actually, I am a Mormon." I was like, "Oh, really? How how did you <laughs> how did you?" And you grew up with them in Zimbabwe. Yeah, and uh, mm-hmm. how did you become a Mormon? So he explained to me uh, that uh, his sister, uh, I think, was a Mormon, and he has been inactive for a while. So he kind of. I uh, rejoined the church again after after we met, right? So he became a member then. The time we were not talking, he was a member. So we never spoke about the church at all. Like, it was never a conversation. So that's how I found out he belonged to the church, right? So I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I mean, I know you. You're a good person, you know, like... I don't. I, I didn't assume anything about the church at that point. And I started, like, learning like about the church like i remember going on youtube like and typing uh the mormon church so funny thing is from wisconsin no i i'm i'm staying with him in provo right now okay okay right? so i'm like looking up things about the church because of course i want to know other things to impress the professor with right like oh yeah i find out this about your school and things like that so to I'm, apply when yeah you're, when yeah you're to apply yeah interviewing okay and YouTube is not the best place to look for those things. <laughs> I started, or it is, or it is. <laughs> <laughs> not if you want to impress a woman professor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was bombarded by these documentaries about Joseph Smith, <laughs> and I was like, uh, "Okay." At that point, I ignored it, right? And then. My meeting with the professor kind of fell through at that point. So I was just like hanging out in Provo with him. And then at that moment, uh, my relationship with my professor in Milwaukee, that's when he turned really sour. And he did not like the fact that I was looking into other schools. And uh, he wrote a letter to my graduate school telling them how terrible of a person I was. So I made a decision of not going back in that instant. So... Why my experience in Milwaukee and everything I was talking about before is relevant is I found myself in a place where I felt lost. Like, okay, now I it looks like I'm going to get kicked out of grad school, right? And I do not see a way I can make amends with my professor. And I don't like him as a person. So I did not see myself going back to him, begging to take me back, right? And I was just like, okay, it is what it is. I have to figure out a new plan, right? So I'm lost. And my only hope now is hopefully BYU will understand me and take me in, right? So I went back again to BYU trying to see uh, the professor. I don't know if I can say his name, but I'm not going to say it. So, and then they gave me an application. Like, oh, you can apply. And so during the application, that's when I found out that if you belong to the church, school is going to be cheaper for you. You might afford it. And I was like, wait, uh, I don't understand this, right? So I went back to my friend. I'm talking to him, like, okay, so it's saying here yeah, if you are a mom, like, what is that? Like, what, what does this mean, right? So then he starts explaining to me about, okay, uh, if, so if you belong to the church like me and then, you know, and I was like, how do, how do you how do you prove this? I have an experience in the back of my of my mind when I fooled people to be a Catholic <laughs> before, right? So I've done this before. I do understand I have that ability if I need to use it, right? So I'm asking him like, so how 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 do you how do you prove to people that you're a mom? Like, tell me more about it. <laughs> so like, he's the like golden question. Yeah. So he's telling me like, okay, so for someone like you, you have to meet the missionaries, take your classes get baptized, uh, take more glasses, get in doubt. What is getting in doubt? And we go into another conversation. I'm like, okay, this seems like it's going to take a while. I cannot, I cannot <laughs> do this. So in my head, I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to fake this because I want to go to school. 
you know. At that point, I have to admit, it did not feel right for me to do that, you know. And I remember talking to my mom and, and trying to explain to my parents, like, so it looks like I'm no longer going to be in that grad school, right? So I need to find other more uh, opportunities for me to continue with my education. And it was difficult news for me to tell them, right? Because I also felt like I blew a, I blew a golden opportunity. Like I had my school paid for. All I had to do was just like, you know, suck it up and deal with this person I did not like until I graduate. But as a person, I cannot do that. Like I cannot pretend we are cool when we are not cool. I cannot, I don't know. I well, and compromise. to be fair, it wasn't that you just didn't like him. Like he had a history of yeah, he yeah not graduating PhD candidates and not publishing their work. So yeah, so he was kind of abusive. Yeah, in a way. And this dude is not even like American. Like he's from Vietnam, mm. and he has a weird work ethic where he would ask me to come into the lab during weekends. Like I have to be constantly in the lab, even times when I felt like I have pretty much done everything I need to do right now. Like I need to go home and relax because I was also a teaching assistant and that was hard for me to be a teaching assistant here because the, I am participating in an education system that I'm not familiar with. So apart from teaching itself, there is a lot of cultural stuff I have to learn so I can interact with American kids, right? So it was a lot on my plate. And I remember like having this conversation with him, like, okay, when I'm the semester that I am a, a TA, can we chill on the research, on the research stuff? Because I have to do labs, I have to grade their papers, I have to communicate with the professors of the classes I am a TA on, right? So it's a lot. I don't have time in the lab, but his thing was like, yeah, once you're done with your teaching, come to the lab and do your work. Pretty much. I'm not sleeping at this point, right? Because I, I have to do my labs. I receive my reports from my students and grade them and help them. And I also have TA hours where I just sit there. They come with their problems. I deal with them, right? And they still email me afterwards. And I'm like, this is a lot, right? Yeah, I'll just say as someone who went through grad school as an American, privileged, <clears throat> grad school can be highly exploitative where where you pay, you pay grad students almost nothing. Right. And they live in sometimes very um, low socioeconomic status kind of levels, and then you're at the you're at the mercy of your your advisor. And if your advisor is abusive or um, inconsiderate, your mm -hmm. life can be really hell. And I'd say half of the people in my cohort who were Americans from middle to upper middle class families washed out of graduate school. So it's brutal in and of itself. If, if English is your second language and you're here on a student visa mm -hmm. and you're here from a foreign country and, and you're and that financial assistance is essential for you. Yes. You could be absolutely exploited in very, very unhealthy. Uh, and, and this and wasn't his first time. Abusive ways. You had met people that, that he yeah, had done that Yeah. Too. Yeah. The, the other guy who I was sort of like replacing, he was also from Zimbabwe yeah. and he was telling me how it's been like, I observed him his final uh, year and it was brutal. And he had a family here and yeah. I, I did not, he had a wife and yeah. a kid. And he was telling me stories about other students that pretty much did not graduate from the same lab. And he kind of had a reputation too, even in our department, you know. And these are things that I started le learning when it was kind of too late for me, even like to switch labs, you know. So I was I was in a, in a place where pretty much these new cave balls were being thrown at me. So then I found myself here. There's a decent chance he was treating you like he was treated when he was in grad school. Pro Not yeah. to excuse it, mm -hmm. but there's a decent chance he was just doing what his advisor did to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it, it makes a lot of sense too, because uh, learning about his life, yeah, it looked like he's someone who he will experience quite a difficult life, you yeah. know, coming from Vietnam and things like that. And even the way he talked about himself, you can tell he's like, I, you know, I accomplished this by struggling. So you why, struggle, you, you're going to you, struggle. You too. can struggle too. Like yeah. it's pretty normal. You know, this is part of this life. Yeah. But, and um, I remember it one time I, we, it got really heated in his office. The first time he, told me that he's going to send me back from where I come from. And I literally was like, something snapped in me. And I was like, 
I am 20 something years. You do realize that I've lived pretty much my, my entire life in Zimbabwe, right? Like you telling me you're sending me back to Zimbabwe is not a punishment. <laughs> you are sending me back to my environment. Like this is foreign for me. And he did not like me talking to talking to him like that and he kicked me out. It, that was the first time I received a, a letter from that disciplinary committee or something, oh, you know. Man. Oh. And then, yeah, he's like, yeah, he's disrespectful. He doesn't communicate well with me, blah, blah, blah. And he's like bashing me. Because at that point, what he did not realize is our department chairman called me and he's like, here's the thing. I'm going to tell you this in confidence. Read his letter. This is the letter he wrote about you. And I read it. And I remember asking my chairman, I was like, so if he feels this way about me, why did he pick me as his candidate for his lab? You know, cause he was even bashing my college and you know, my education. And I was like, it doesn't make any sense. Cause you saw this before you asked me to come here. And he literally was bland with me. And he's like, if I were you, I would look for another school, you know? And I only realized that years after that, he had a guy who spent about four or five years in his lab and they had an argument and that dude struggled to graduate. Like mm -hmm. he had to go back to his country. I think he was from Slovenia or something. And finally he had to negotiate with that department chairman for the department to grant him like a master's or something. Yeah. So he, that's what he was insinuating, like hoping that I, I'm familiar with the story, but I, I wasn't at that point. He was trying to help you. He was not. trying to help me. Yeah. But I, he was referencing a story that I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't familiar with. So, I mean, coming back to me being in Provo after all these things have happened, and I'm telling my parents this, like, okay, so <laughs> this is the situation where I'm finding myself in, right? So my mom being as religious as she is, you know, every time you encounter a difficult page in your life, every Christian is going to utter a familiar statement, right? you need to pray about it, you know, and things like that. So we kind of started talking about that. And I realized in that moment that I have never uh, taken like religion as serious or like felt like I belonged to a church or anything. So at this point, my prayers are kind of like freestyles, right? Like I'm just <laughs> like, like, hey, I'm here. So you know me, <laughs> the other dude. So... I'm not, it's not even structured at all. If I can spend Sundays however I like. I can go to the Catholic Church if I want to. I can not go. Like, nothing is actually pushing me mm -hmm. to be a religious person. Nothing is pushing me to be prayerful. So, that feeling of feeling like you do not belong to an institution that can reinforce those uh, habits that can help you in difficult situations. Like, oh, you know, if I if I was, if I belong to a church, maybe in this instance, I, I might go talk to my bishop, I might go talk to whoever. I found myself thinking about that, but I never thought of joining the church. So now, which brings me back to my friend. So my friend, it's Sunday, right? I'm staying with them. So all these like- Sandy, Utah? Yeah, he, uh, he was in Provo. Oh, Provo. So I say, come Sunday, oh, the, day Sunday. Of, the day of church, right? Okay. He's like, oh, hey, uh, me and my wife are going to go to church. You can come with us if you want. You can stay. It's fine. In Provo. Yeah, in Provo. So me being a respectful person who is living in someone's house, right, I did not feel comfortable staying at home and then, then going to church, you know. So I was like, hey, I'll come with you. So then we are trying to leave, right? And he's like, oh, he has some pants. He's, he has a white shirt. And I was like, wait, what? Why? You know, but I, I, I did not really ask him why do you want me to dress like that right because i'm going to other churches that we're not dressing we're not like formally dressing and whatever so i did dress up and then we went so we go to the church right we attend the church nothing seems out of place for me you know it feels fine and then i attend the gospel principal class after the sacrament and the uh the lady then really like liked me and we struck our conversation and we were talking about it and I found out that she was also like going through a divorce or something and her husband moved to California and her kids were 
kind of being difficult because they want to go with their dad because he has the cool house by the beach and she's just like a single mom here and things like that. So, you know, struggling people, they have a weird way of relating to each other, right? So then I was like, oh, okay, cool. Then we have the gospel principal class and I was weirdly participating. I don't know why. <laughs> and it was good. I, I, I loved it, right? Then we went back home. So after we went back home, that's when the missionaries just like started showing up. In know. Milwaukee? No, in Provo. I oh, did, still I, Provo. I didn't go back to Milwaukee at this point. Like, oh, you moved to Utah. Yeah, at this point, I'm kind of living in two places. I still have my apartment in Milwaukee, and my professor already sending me this email. I was like, yeah, you know, we are pretty much done. Okay. You know, so I'm not, so you kind of moved I'm not motivated to go to Milwaukee yeah. at all, right? Yeah. So then that following week, that's when I received like a, a letter from my graduate school, like telling me, like, oh, yeah, he's... Like he's saying he cannot work with you anymore. So, you know, you can. That you're jumped by your. Yeah. You kind of. Yeah. College. You, you kind of have to, uh. you know. So I was like, okay, cool. So what does this mean to me, right? So then I call my office of uh, international students, right? And then they are explaining to me, like, okay, so for your visa to be valid, you need to be in school. So you have to find a school, get into it, you know, and see if we can transfer your service number and we you know all those people excel. So now I'm I have to act fast, right? So I'm the I'm in this weird mental like status where everything is happening fast and I need to react fast. And then at the same time the conversation I have with my parents made me feel like spiritually I'm lagging, right? So I later on like talk to my friend about it and I'm explaining it to I'm explaining it to him like oh so this is the situation I am. I need to find out how I can stay legal here because I I cannot afford not to be legal, right? So it's like, oh, you know what? The other thing you can do is you can like apply for a work visa. Like you can, you know, apply for asylum and then they can give you a work visa. So it will give you time to figure out how you're going to do it because you're not going to get in school like right now. That's for sure, right? So then we did that. You know, we met with a few people who kind of helped me with that. And then we put that in. So now what it means is Going back to Milwaukee is not going to work because I don't have an income in Milwaukee, right? So I cannot stay in my apartment. So I have to move, right? And the only place I can move at this moment, the only person I know is my friend here. So so that decision was kind of made in that, at that moment. Like, okay, so we're going to stay with you whilst you're figuring out how you're going to do this, right? So me staying in Provo, I just like, you know, was trying to do like peace jobs and stuff like that. But mentally, I was not really there. Like, I felt like I was failing pretty much in everything. I'm not in school. I'm a school dropout. I cannot really work using my college degree from Zim, right? I cannot use it. So I pretty much beat down. But then I started to recover, like, once I got my work permit and stuff, right? Like I started like talking to more people, trying to get like doing more jobs and stuff, wasn't figuring my way out. So, which brings me to me keeping on talking to my parents now because they need updates, right? Like, so what are you doing now? What are you gonna do? And Jesus is keeping on coming up, right? Like, okay, you need, you need to keep doing this, you need to keep doing this. And I feel like, okay, this is when I told my mom and I said, mom, like I haven't been going to church like in a while to be honest with you so i do feel like these prayers and things that you're sending towards me they feel weird in this moment right and at the same time the missionaries are popping are popping into the house like um they'll come on monday they were like hey Gerard, hi we just want to see how you're doing then they'll leave like they are not really like kind of teaching teaching me at this moment so then, which brings me to my friend, one day we're just having a conversation and he's like, oh, have we ever thought of actually like talking to the missionaries? And I was like, I talk to them. Like, they come to your house like three times a week, right? Like we talked and he's like, no, I mean like taking lessons. So that's when he kind of okay to me like, oh, so those were not really lessons. They just like kind of befriending me <laughs> in a way. And I was like, ah, oh, I don't know. Okay, sure, right? So then I talked to them, like, hey, I want to take lessons. So they show up, they give me the Book of Mormon and other pamphlets and then their DVD to watch, right? 
And that was not a good idea <laughs> because what happened is I watched the DVDs, right? And the DVDs kind of echoed what I had watched on YouTube before with the documentaries I watched. So I was going back and forth between the DVDs and YouTube videos, DVDs, YouTube videos, DVDs. And I did not like what I was hearing at all. But as someone who doesn't have a direction at that moment, as someone who doesn't have like a concrete habit of actually going to a church where I can you know, factually dispute these things. Like this time it's just like YouTube. I could I couldn't like put myself in a state where I can make a conclusion about it. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna have listened to these guys and I'm gonna compare what they're saying and what I have heard. And also in this at this time I am working like moving jobs, landscaping jobs jobs and I'll meet people who were not Mormons but they are, they live in Utah. And they also have their vision of Mormons that they were telling me, right? Like, oh, uh, so you moved from Zimbabwe? And yeah, uh, were you were you surprised when you came here to live with the Mormons? And I was like, what's wrong with the Mormons? And they're like, oh, dude, like they have like, you know, five wives or something. You, you have never seen that? I was like, no, I've never seen that. Then I, I asked my friend, I was like, hey, do you guys practice polygamy? And he's like, no, we don't. It's the other church. What other church? I go back to YouTube again. Look up Mormon polygamy, and then I see this story about some people breaking out and things like that. And my friend did not get into deeper conversations with me. Like he had this tendency of pushing the missionaries to me. Like he wouldn't really answer my questions. You know, he would be like, "Oh yeah, you can ask the missionaries. Oh, you can ask the missionaries." And the missionaries I had at that time, they did not answer my questions. So. I got to a point where we did the lessons pretty much to the end of them and I'm not getting baptized. So these guys would just come in and check in with me until they got transferred. <coughs> so one set of uh, missionaries came and went and another set of brothers came again. Then we started lessons again. I am not budging at this point. I'm just like, this is something that does not feel right, right? So... At that moment, I think I went, <coughs> I went through the second set of uh, missionaries still not getting baptized. And my friend is asking me, so when are you going to get baptized? And I'm like, dude, at this point in my life, I feel like I have other things that I need to fix, to be, I need to fix before I can, you know, make this decision. Because I am kind of like getting hope for this moment, right? I can work. I'm getting a little bit of money, you know, so it feels like I can swing it, right? I can take my time and, you know, draft a proper application and you look into more schools. So I'm kind of hopeful. But at the same time, my parents keep on asking me about how am I praying about it. It's also kind of giving me these guilty vibes like, okay, I'm not really praying about it though. I'm not going to any chapel or anything like that. So in, in the back of my head, I still need to belong somewhere. Then the third set of missionaries comes around and this time they are sisters. So <laughs> and we start lessons again. Uh, pretty much everything they are saying, I've heard it before two times, right? And I'm just like, okay, yeah, yeah, I do, I do get it, I do get it, I do get it. And then I started having these kind of like realistic conversations with them when I was like, okay, so can you tell me how you would feel that you are ready for baptism? Like, how were your journeys like? Like, you guys. So then they started sharing about personal revelations and stuff like that. And yeah, you read the Book of Mormon, then you pray for an answer. And if you get the answer, if it's true or not, uh, then you can make your decision. And I did read the Book of Mormon and my prayers were slacking at that point. So I'm keeping on trying to, to believe if I can, you know, get a revelation or if I can get an answer or something like that. And it's not really waking up for me. But one thing I would say it stood out to me was the story of Joseph Smith. I had a hard time like accepting it. Like I kept going back and forth with it. And the fact that if pretty much everyone I talked to was a Mormon, they were true, 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 true. Was like really repetitive. Like everyone was like, oh, the Book of Mormon is true. This is a true church. 
if you pray for it, if it's true, and then you get this answer that, of course, this is a true church. And I'm just like, I've never heard anyone say this word a lot like this. So then I had a conversation <laughs> with one of my friends at work who was an ex-Mormon. And I and I was like, hey, you you are a Mormon, right? And he's like, I used to be. And I was like, how do you feel about the church being true? And his response was just like laughing. He's like, what, are you taking lessons or something? And I was like, actually, I am. So I'm, I'm kind of trying to understand this. And he was like, I don't believe that. And I was like, okay, can you tell me your story? So his story is like, he was born in the church, raised in the church, got married. And then for some reason, because of his work, he started drinking. His wife found out he got divorced. Then he got out of the church. So pretty much that was like his story. And he's like, yeah, I mean, other than that, like I, I, there's nothing more I can give to you, right? Then I go back to my friend. Hey, how do you feel about this being the only true church? And then my friend is like, of course it is. Like uh, if, if you look at, I mean, uh, the things that you read in the Book of Mormon and like the testimonies that you're going to read, you're going you're gonna to find out it's true. But still, interpretation is of true is still vague at this point. So then I was like, okay, can you explain to me, like, how did it feel true to you? Then his story was, again, the story of Joseph Smith. Like, yeah, Joseph Smith was asking the same questions when he was 14 or something. And, you know, he got this revelation. And I'm just like, <sighs> my problem at this point is the story of basing your testimony is the one that I kind of have a problem with. And specifically... Because as growing up in the churches I went to, there is this weird statement that nobody can see God and he's been echoed and echoed and echoed to an extent that I even believed it. So reading a story about someone who says they saw God, you know, it's kind of like Mad Men tells to me. I'm like, okay, so you saw him, actually him, him. Because I think the Bible and maybe even the Book of Mormon say that no man can see God and exactly. live. Exactly. Like right. right, yeah. And uh, I, I cannot remember the scripture exactly in the Bible of someone who asked to see God and he did not show himself to him entirely. He partially showed, him, showed himself to him and that person became blind, right? So I, I remember like talking to him about this and I was like, I don't know, it feels weird. Even like with to Moses, he appeared as a burning bush. Like he... Didn't like right. he didn't like really like show himself like him him right like so I'm struggling with that part because I have never heard this so for me to say this is true it's gonna I don't know <laughs> it's kind of weird to me that I can say I am you're kind of a critical thinker by this point right yeah I'm fine like, I'm fine with him saying he's or an angel or something like that but like God God now <laughs> so then. The system missionary almost gave up too, because again, at this, <laughs> at this point, I'm just like, okay, I, I do love everything about these people. I am about Mormon people, right? At this point, people are coming to our house, talking to me, you know, being nice, and I'm going to church every Sunday. I'm not missing a day. I'm going to church every Sunday, even though I'm not even a Mormon. Up to a point where one day, the bishop asked me to give an opening prayer, and my friend had to tell the bishop that he's not a member. <laughs> so that's how that's how I that's how much I was going to change. It's fine, I've done it before. Yeah, and I, I said yes. I was just like, oh yeah, sure, I will say it. And did then, you get invited <laughs> to do a baby blessing too? I did. I I actually <laughs> went to to the because there was this other uh, uh, family. I think they are from Nigeria in uh, in the ward that we were going to, and they they kind of moved after us. So this guy used to just see me, seeing me in the church, right? I'm showing up. So he assumed I have the priesthood, right? And he's like, hey, we're going to bless our baby this Sunday. Like, do you want to be part of it? <laughs> and I was like, oh, sure. <laughs> I don't even know that I'm, I'm not supposed to be there. So I just joined the circle. And oh, you did join? I did. <laughs> and we, you did a touch too. Yeah. You did the Catholic <laughs> circle. So, but this time I did, not, next? I did not know that I was not allowed to be there. <laughs> this is how I found out. So after I did that, 
another person in the world, uh, their wife was sick and they texted me like, hey, Brother Benzi, do you mind joining us giving a blessing to my wife? <laughs> and then that's when I told my friend, I was like, oh yeah, we're going to give a blessing to, to this person. And he's like, you cannot do that. And I was like, what do you mean? They asked me and he's like, you need the priesthood. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I told this person, I texted them back and I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Like I cannot do that. But I didn't, I didn't say that, like, I don't have the priesthood. You but probably just thought you were a sinner. Yeah, so you were just like, oh, okay, uh, I, I'll just find someone else. But You're unworthy. Yeah, but funny thing is, the same person who had the wife they wanted to bless, we actually talked the next Sunday. <laughs> and he was like, just open to me, he's like, yeah, I know after I saw you with the baby blessing, I thought of asking you to bless my wife. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, uh, about that. I actually don't have the priesthood. <laughs> so that was like the only person I've been open to about that specific instance. So that's how much I was going to change, right? But still, for me to actually say, I read the story of Joseph Smith and this is what I felt like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get baptized. I, I still had doubts at that point. So then... Uh, the sister missionaries, they got transferred and then another, and, 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 and another, and I think a third sister came. I don't know what happened in our, but there were still sisters that came around. And by that time, I was friends with Mackenzie now. I had met Mackenzie. And so I started inviting her to my lessons. I was like, hey, do you mind just like coming in and sit with me? And then you can hear what these people are talking about. That was like a fresh RM. So I was yeah. so excited so she was to be like, a member present. Yeah. And I'm not even a member, right? So then I'm like, okay, just just come to my lessons. And then, you know, hopefully I wanted someone I can have discussions with that is not like from our ward or my friend, right? Because I wanted a third, <laughs> a, third, a third part opinion. So then, and also it's also around the time that like uh, I had asked her out to and my kids was like, oh, I don't, no, we're not going to go out. <laughs> <laughs> I friend zoned him. So she friend zoned me. After that. But then in our discussion, you mentioned something like, oh, I don't want you to feel like I'm not dating you because you're not a Mormon. Yeah. And I also didn't want to feel like we should date while you were going through yeah. the discussions. I didn't want that to be a part of your decision. Yeah. So at this point, when, I, when this happened, in my mind, I was like, bingo, this is the person I want to be friends with because... If he's open enough to me to tell me that, hey, I'm not looking at you as a Mormon guy, maybe this is this is a person who can give me like an opinion that is not specifically like I want you to be in the church. So hence I'm pushing you to understand this story, right? Less biased. Yeah, less opinion. biased, yeah. <laughs> and she's not even aware at this point, like that's what she's doing, right? Like we kinda like later on find out what I was thinking and what was happening with her, right? So I'm inviting her to to uh to my lessons and she's showing up and we, we will have discussions afterwards and like go for a drive or something like that. Then this happened. Um, I think uh, my, I realized that Mackenzie was like different from other Mormon girls I had tried to date in the sense that I've had people tell me that I play weird music, right? And Meaning I- Meaning what kind of music? Just like, hip hop music or music where people are cursing. Oh. And I've heard people like come into my car and they're like, oh wow, you play really interesting music. And I'm like, hmm. I mean, it's from here. So maybe you guys, you know, but I did not realize that what they're actually trying to tell me is your content is unusual, right? And then I befriend Mackenzie and Mackenzie is listening to hip hop, like clean versions, right? And I'm just like, I've never had anyone like go through with me like their two thousands playlist who is like a Mormon girl like do that like in my car and she's like oh do you like T Pain or I'm like who T Pain she's like do you like T Pain I like T Pain and then like she's playing like you know that was the person that I yeah like she's like play, she's like playing these these <laughs> songs want to pick a better person now <laughs> <laughs> yeah can we just rewind that <laughs> is it Tupac but, yeah. yeah she's like telling me all these like hip hop artists that she, like, she was listening to and things. Like, and I was like, wait, this person is different. But at the same time, 
This is the same person who told me she went on a mission. She went to Jerusalem, like super spiritual, right? Like super Mormon girl. And I was like, I like this girl. I don't care if she doesn't date me, but I want to be a friend, right? So I literally like asked her the second time. I asked her out the second time and she said no again. And I was like, hey, you know what? Like I'm happy to be your friend. Like I, it's fine. Like we don't have to date. So then I'm inviting her to my lessons. And then that's around the time Lemonade came out. <laughs> yeah. And then Beyonce's Lemonade. Beyonce's Lemonade. And then this visual album. Yeah. <laughs> so this Mormon girl texted me. It's like, hey, do you want to watch Lemonade together? And I was like, what? And I was like, sure. But I have a lesson that day that you were free. I was like, I have a lesson so we can meet up after my lesson. And she's like, oh, fine, I can come to your lesson. So, like, she came to my lesson. And then afterwards, like, she had brought a blankie and her laptop. And we were sitting outside my apartment and we were watching the money together. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, she's cool. Like, this is a cool friend. She's different. So then I started initiating uh, conversations like about the temple because around this time I was learning more and more stuff. And I remember asking and I was like, hey, what significance does the temple have, like, have to you? It's like, oh, yeah, she's like sharing uh, her stories about uh, the temple and her testimonies and, you know, spiritual experiences she had in the temple. And I was like, oh, wow. And she asked me, she's like, how do you feel about it? And I was like, I, I don't know. I, this idea of going to the temple is kind of new to me because for me, uh, temple, I have used that word referring, you know, from that scripture, our bodies are the temple of the Lord, you know, so we should treat them likewise. So I was like, but yeah, it makes sense how you're describing this place and how it can be equated to our bodies, right? So then we started having a conversation that kind of made more sense than my lessons from then. Like I would ask her questions, I, I, like questions I have about the Bible and uh, about the Bible and the Book of Mormon. One thing I loved about Mackenzie was she would say, I don't know when she did not know. She's like, I don't know. Uh, huh, I will look into it. I've never heard of that. This was new to me because the, and later on I, I admitted to you why I did not, why the first two cents of uh, missionaries couldn't baptize me is I would ask a question. They wouldn't say they don't know. They would try to answer my question and they would give me an answer that is not enough at all. It's like things that I'm not asking. But then, so, but like just in, uh, interacting with someone who's more money and they're like uh, able to say, I don't know, I'll look into it. I've never heard of that. Kind of like made me like him more, which kind of also made me believe like, okay, so here's the thing. I don't have to get definite answers right now. You know, like people don't know for real, you know? So maybe... I might start understand, understanding other things later on. So a few weeks after that, I think I, deci I decided to get baptized. I was like, I'm going to get baptized, and then I'm going to keep on learning about this. But still, uh, I remember when we were talking, and you asked me in my car one day when you were like, is there anything you, you have questions about? And I was like, ah, oh, no. But in my head, I was just like, oh, I don't know if I should bring up uh, Joseph Smith's story because I still want to understand, like, why am I not fully accepting that? But I was like, okay, um, maybe I will understand it later. Maybe this is not the time that I need to know more about it, you know? Was, so, the, was the main problem with Joseph Smith just that he saw God and you weren't sure that was possible? Or were there other things you knew about Joseph Smith that caused gave you pause? My main problem was him saying he's so good. Okay. And then how other people talked about him. I had a problem with people saying he's the only true prophet or something. And I was just like, ah, I don't know. That's debatable. Like he cannot, and you're not really like providing these evidence that anyone has never heard of before, you know? So I was just like, I, I don't know. Like, Two people can be right at the same time and they're in different parts of the world and you never know about it and you only know of the other one person or four, five, six, or more people can, can be right about one thing. But the thing is, also at his time, you are only knowing about him because you are kind of like in the same location as him. So you don't know if another random guy in another part of the world is having a similar experience, right? 
You're a critical thinker. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's 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 was like my thing with people saying like this is the only true thing you know. Of. I'm like and Joseph's the prophet. Yeah, I'm like yeah, you have never been to another part of the world though, so you cannot <laughs> you cannot say that. So those were like things that I kept on hearing and people were saying this is the one and only true change. And I would be like, okay. It, yeah, yeah, that can be fine. I mean, I'm okay with it. But also, at the same time, we need to be, you know what I mean? We need to believe that undoubtedly, like, yeah, we have exhausted each and every religion we know about. And this is the only people who are making sense, you know? And also, the other thing is, like, people are not willing to to talk about the Book of Mormon. This, I mean, to talk about the Bible the same way they talk about the Book of Mormon, partly because me talking to non-Mormon people, one thing they mention is Mormons, I mean, a few things that I, I noticed from talking to other people is like Mormons, they have their own Bible, right? They they read their own Bible and they have their own Jesus. And then me talking to missionaries and asking them about the Book of Mormon and them admitting to me saying like, no, the Book of Mormon is not a substitute for the Bible. But then at the same time, me asking them scriptures from the Bible, like they could not really answer my questions. They'll be like, oh, well, if you read the Book of Mormon, and I was just like, well, you are doing the exact same thing that other people say that are not Mormons, right? Because you cannot answer me a question from the Bible by telling me that go into the Book of Mormon. You know what I mean? So kind of like you're saying, this is way, there's more way than what you're, where you're coming from. So that was, that was like, uh, one of the few questions, I mean, a few of the questions that I, I had me going into my baptism. But I was like, oh, well, I don't think I have spent enough time on this. I might find out something new later that might explain this, right? I don't want to be that guy who's like, oh, okay, if I had come across this book, I could have I could have bab gotten baptized like three months ago. So then I went in with that mentality, like I'm going to grow, Right. So this was me texting my mother. Hey, mom, this is what I've decided to do. I'm going to join this church. Do you know about it? And that's when I found out that my mom knew about the church. She's like, yeah, I've heard of them. I know what they're about. And I was like, hmm, interesting, because I, I did not know. And she's like, yeah, they are here. All right. So we started having a conversation with my mom. And she's like, OK, so how do you feel about joining them? And I was like, oh, I feel fine. And then I remember her asking me, and she said, is there anything that they are teaching you that you've never heard of before or that does not align with the way you see Jesus Christ? And I was like, yeah, as far as Jesus Christ is concerned, not really. But in the story of how the church started, I've never heard of it. And she's like, is that enough for you not to join them? Or like, is that enough for you not you know, to feel like you can be prayerful about it. I was like, no, I mean, not really. She's like, oh, well, there you have your answer then, you know, get baptized, it's fine. So then I did get baptized. And then after we got baptized, we moved to a different ward, which was bigger and like more demand for cause, right? So. Can I, can I ask you a couple questions? Uh -huh. Okay, so I really want to kind of, pause and analyze this moment in time. <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, but if you talk to many Mormon missionaries, especially in Europe, mm -hmm. but also in all over the world, um, immigrants to whatever country they're serving or international students are often targeted by Mormon missionaries. Like I've heard this in the UK, mm -hmm. for example, these days, a lot of the only baptisms that are happening in the UK are immigrants into the UK or international students into the UK that are wanting to learn English. And so like meeting some English speaking missionaries, having a community because you're displaced from your home, you're, you're away from your home, you're in a foreign country, you're wanting to learn English. And then you've got these friendly missionaries that are coming to you. That's, that's a real, for, 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 a, from a mission a Mormon missionary standpoint, that's a real opportunity because you're, a, you know, you're vulnerable, you're away from family, you need community, you might feel lost or scared. And, you know, there's some in, practicing English. So I don't, did you even know that kind of like your profile in Provo is a typical profile for what Mormon missionaries might target, 
you know, throughout the world. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Okay. Know okay. Yeah. Um, I, that's my understanding. Uh, uh, does that make you feel anything when it, when I when you hear me say that? It does, cause <laughs> yeah, cause I I even remember talking to my kids. I'm like sometimes like like you are saying because of the situation you are, the attention you are getting is not a red flag. You're just like, okay, why are these people so like? They're so nice. Yeah, they're so they love nice. Me. Yeah, they're so yeah. nice and you know, friendly. And exactly. I'm in a new place, so yeah, of course, if people are paying attention to me, yeah, I want to be part of that community. That like, I'm like especially oh. coming from the community immediately. From Wisconsin, I mean, yeah, that you exactly, yeah, and also like it's kind of relatable to me too because like that's kind of what Zim culture is. Is like, oh yeah, like we we are all like you know we we want to know everyone who everyone who is in our village. So the friendliness of Mormon cult, Mormon missionary culture reminded you of your home culture. Yeah, it reminded me of my home culture. It's like, yeah, so you see a new guy moving in in the next house, you're like, hey, who, you know, how are you? Like, introduce me to my family, your family. And then you have to learn their totem and things like that, you know, like, it's just who we are. We're just like welcoming people. Mm. So in that instance, yeah, I, I do, like, agree with you. Like, it does not seem like a red flag at all. I did not feel like, oh, yeah, I'm a target. They were like, oh, there's that guy. Like, let's go talk to him, right? I'm just like, okay. This is when normal. you had other members coming to your lessons, so you were making friends, you were feeling included. Yes, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, the, the first and they were families, and you didn't have a family. Yeah, I did not. You're in yeah. a family ward, which is also mm -hmm. different. They were so nice, like, and then I would, I would get invited to dinners. I got invited to dinners where I had I'd asked my friend to take along, but the invitation was mine, <laughs> right? I'm like, hey, this person said, you know, like, hey, can I bring my friend? You know, yeah, sure, you can bring him. So that happened to me. I, I made more friends that time. Even some of them, I still talk to them. We still follow each other on Instagram and, and stuff like that. You know, they are, they are genuinely like nice people, but like they, they that idea of like, oh yeah, he, he can be a plus one to our church. I never thought about it that way. I was just like, okay, this, this seemed to be, which brings me to like having that conflict of, okay, why am I not accepting this narrative yet? I cannot like pinpoint anything about these people around me where I can be like, they don't believe in crazy stuff. I'm meeting these people who are going to be how are you? They are lawyers, some of them, you know, like they have good professions that Mormons are really educated people. So the idea of me like being like, okay, maybe this guy fooled these people and they are also like, just in general, nice people. So that was a struggle I had. I was like, why am I not believing this story? Because they are living the good life. They have a nice community and they want me to be part of that community, you know, and I'm just like this guy who they're like, oh, hey, Brother Benzi, you know, do you want to help us with this? Brother Benzi, come here. And I'm like, ah, am I a bit present? <laughs> you know? So yeah, that, that's the mentality I went in with is, okay, I am going to grow and I'm going to understand more things when I am in there, right? I was expecting to find more and more good things and more and more information that will make me erase that doubt I have before and all these questions I'm asking myself. And my mom was validating like, oh yeah, I know them, like they are good people. I don't know anything weird about them, you know? Kind of like give me that, uh, you know, certification on, on my decision. Like, okay, cool. So if mom says it's okay, then, <laughs> you know, I this is fine, right? So then, yeah, I win, got baptized. So, so sorry, this is just, it's really important for me just because, you know, my hope is that people from Africa, Zimbabwe, all over the world mm -hmm. who are investigating Mormonism can just really see what's happening very clearly. You know, if, if in some way we can kind of name this so that like people investigating Mormonism can actually find it and watch it before they make the commitments um, I, you know, because we believe in informed consent. And so, uh, the people should know what they're joining fully before they join. But as I'm just kind of really trying to like piece this apart. So your, your parents probably are wanting you to get committed to a church because they think it'll be good for you. Mm -hmm. You, things didn't work out in Wisconsin. So you're like wanting to stay here, but you're feeling like that might be threatened in some ways, but you find this great community and you start to feel loved and accepted and um, everyone's nice to you. And so like, that's all on the side of like, man, maybe I should join. Yes. And on the other side is your inner voice that's saying, I'm not so sure about this. That's on the other side. Yes. And then I imagine at some point you were taught by missionaries like, well, faith, faith is acting 
when you don't really believe. Exactly. And so if you plant the seed of faith, you may not know it now or believe it now, but if you start acting as though you believe and know it, that'll come later. That'll come later, yeah. Was that part of what... what you have just, you, exactly. You just like reminded me of something that I also learned during that time that I was being taught about faith, right? I got a paid on the back as an investigator at that point. And it was like, yeah, you know, you can have doubts or whatever, but like, like you said, like that's what faith is. Like you believe in something, like, oh, it will happen even though you don't have enough evidence. Like definitely it's going to happen. So you just like invest yourself in it. And I was told I am a golden investigator. And honestly speaking, anyone who has like been given any form of award, it doesn't make you want to immediately like research more. It validates the work you have done mm -hmm. up to that point. So yeah. you're just like, man, if I am this golden investigator, I have asked the right questions. I have done like the, you know, the right steps and I have asked really valid questions, which is like at that point you're like, okay, so if I have reached to be a golden investigator, why am I not making a decision? Mm -hmm. I should have a decision by now. So that also like makes you biased like, you're like, okay, let me just join them because pretty much I'm really accomplished. My CV is really impressive. So I have asked everything I need to. And these people are telling me like, you this like, I don't know, Brother Benz, what anything else you can do at this point. Like you are, you have done everything. And I was like, okay, cool. So which brings me to me calling my mom. Sorry, one more thing. Yeah. I'm sorry. I re I know, I know everyone's dying to hear your story. I just want to kind of like, this is so important to me. Uh -huh. Forgive me audience. I hope you are okay with this. So, Couple of things I'm hearing are well. One is this idea of love bombing. When you when you listen to Luna Corbden's episode on uh, recovering agency and undue influence, uh -huh. this idea of love bombing is that high demand religions, when you are either um, investigating the religion or you're considering leaving it, and they they see an important moment where it's really high stakes in terms of your commitment to the church. This idea of love bombing, uh -huh. of like being inundated with love and support and friendship and kindness, probably a level of treatment you maybe have never, I mean, I'm sure people have been kind to you in the church, but like oftentimes the level of love and commitment shown to an investigator or someone who's questioning the church can be extremely high. And it's, it's a form of influence that I don't think Mormons do intentionally. They just love people and want to share their joy. But what it amounts to is love bombing. It's this intense show of kindness and support and community that ends up being very persuasive when it's probably not going to be what you experience in a sustained way. That's true. And is that fair? I don't want to pl plant that in your mind. We literally but. listened to that podcast and I asked him to rate it. And that was like one of his highest yeah. rated. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's very true. You love Bob. Exactly. And, <laughs> and the good thing about that, I mean, I, one thing I loved about the episode is you listening to it, I literally started like to get, I don't know if it makes sense. Have you ever had your memory explained and you are just like, <laughs> oh my goodness. That's my memory. <laughs> this that's is what we call exactly, it. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, this is exactly what happened. And I, I had no idea. I'm yeah. just like, okay. So yeah. And that's why I'm that's why I'm pausing to really tease this apart. A yeah. couple other things I just want to say is that, well, one thing that's really interesting for me is that the way you converted to Mormonism is actually the same way I converted to Mormonism on my mission. Mm -hmm. Because all growing up, so I'm just connecting with you, uh -huh. and Carol, I don't know if you'll feel this way too. All growing up, I'm like, uh, okay, I love the church, but Lots of other churches think they're true, and my Baptist friends think their church is true, and what about the in people in China? And so in my mind, the whole time, it's like, well, I don't know if it's true. So I'm just totally vibing with you. <laughs> is it true? How do I know? And then I'm praying about the Book of Mormon, and I'm not getting the answers. And I'm like, you know, I don't want to lie and say I know it's true, and I don't know it's true. I just, it's good, but is it true? Yeah. So like, I am identical to you. And it wasn't until I'm on my mission, not just in the MTC, but I'm like going to my very first investigators on my mission in Guatemala where I have to now bear my testimony. And I'm like, what do I, am I going to say? I think it's true. It might be true. I think it's good. I'm like, well, that's weak sauce. So in my mind, I'm like, what do I do? How do I bear my testimony as a missionary? 
to these people. I don't want to lie, but I don't know it's true. And, and I never got the witness. And then the teaching comes into my mind. It's like, well, you know, a testimony is gained by burying it. And so at that moment, as a missionary, I'm like, well, what I'll do, it feels good. So I'm just going to say, I know it's true. And then maybe afterwards the witness will come. And that's, so like, it's almost <laughs> identical. Yeah. What happened to me is what happened to you. Yeah. I want to read. I just, I love when I can search something and I can find it. It feels me with happy endorphins. <laughs> There's a quote that goes along with that, that I think a lot of us are raised in from Holland that says the size of your faith or the degree of your knowledge is not the issue. It is the integrity you demonstrate towards the faith that you do have and the truth you already know. So it's that idea of like line upon line. You already precept know. Precept. You know portions of the truth. You've seen the fruits. You've tasted the fruits. Are they good? Now go forward in faith and then you'll be an integral person uh -huh. in this church that you'll be fortified the more and more you, you know, go drink from this well of life of this, you know, this beautiful tree, all of those metaphors, all of those things. Like <laughs> and <I don't laughs> there's trees, there's wells, you know. Chill. And I don't think Hollander Mormons, I think Mormons are, you know, Mormons are sincere, good, kind people and, and, yeah. and friendly people. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think it's like in a conscious deception on the part of Mormons. I think they're, you know, they love you. They want to share their goodness. And so I don't think they're intentionally love bombing you. And I don't even think Holland or other Mormons are trying to get you to deceive yourself when they teach you to have faith. I just think that's a core Mormon doctrine. You have faith and you plant the seeds of faith and you act like it's true. And then somehow, you know, it's true. So I think it's all done with good intentions, but, but literally that moment that we're pausing, slowing down to look at that moment is in a sense, self betrayal because you don't know, you don't know. Yeah. And you, and you know, you don't know. But then you're told to act as if you know, and then you'll know. And then you hear that quote that you just read, Kara, and Holland's actually saying you knew all along. So it, it slips you into that position of saying you know when you never knew and you don't know. But all of a sudden, because of that little teaching, it slips you into then saying that I know and I knew all along. And that's 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 kind of manipulation. It's kind of coercion because it gets you to the other side where then you're bearing testimony to everybody else as if you know when you really don't. Yeah, There's like See? an in-group, out-group dynamic where you're like, oh, let me just let me just say that I know because you don't want to be right. on the out-group anymore. You just want to be one of the people who know. Because if you were to be true to yourself, then that's you alone. Then you're getting rid of who you're living yeah. with, the community, yeah. any, any friends that you've made. Where do you go? You can't even, where would you even go? I mean, you're living in Provo, Utah. Yeah. So. No. <laughs> and that's why I say you were a critical thinker all along. You were smart. You were turned on inside. And, and a lot of ex-Mormons ask, how can Richard Bushman and Terrell Givens and Fiona Givens, they're so smart. How can they still believe? Religious conversion is emotional and social. It is not intellectual. And that's how it happens. And that's how people convert to the church. That's how even smart people can convert to the church. And that's how so many smart people can remain in the church. They remain for emotional and social reasons. And the intellectual stuff doesn't even matter. It's, it's like Jonathan Haidt in The Righteous Mind. The elephant is the emotion. The rider is your intellect. And, and if the elephant and the rider are ever in conflict, who wins? It's not right. the human riding the elephant. <laughs> it's always the elephant, the emotion, yeah. the social connection. It's going to win almost every time. And the church is still aware of that because Hinckley, what did he say that every member needs a new convert? They need a friend, like they need a job. So they need to feel included. They need to feel like they're participating and yeah. they need to feel socially included. Otherwise they know that you won't stay. Yeah. So people investigating Mormonism, maybe we can make this into a TikTok or a clip or a, or a YouTube short. You need to understand what's happening to you. You are, you are being love bombed by a bunch of sincere, well-intended believing Mormons that are making you feel super good. You are probably in a vulnerable situation where you need a community and a, and a belief system in a church because you fear about what happens to you if you won't. And then you're being taught some doctrine that really does teach you to ignore your inner impulses and to eventually 
consent to a set of beliefs as if you know them when you really don't. And that's undue influence. And the irony is it can often still be good for people. And I am going to even say right. it's probably, I, I imagine that as we get farther along in your story, you're going to tell us, Gerald, right? You're going to tell us that this was actually probably a good thing for you, even though undue influence was used to coerce you into saying you believe something that you didn't believe. You're probably going to tell us that it was probably good for you until it wasn't. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, exactly what I that's the next part. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Is that true? Yeah. That's the next part. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I don't know if I can continue. Like One last thing. Yeah. What were you... Like, we shouldn't tell this, but I'm going to tell, I'm going to, we're going to stop here. <laughs> what were you not told? Like, like we're going to go through and talk later. Like in part two, we're going to talk about your, we're going to talk about McKinsey, your story. And we're going to talk about what you learned and then maybe how your faith changed over time. Mm. But I just want to take the moment to say you got baptized. You were baptized into the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. What were the things you were not taught uh, in preparation for your baptism that you absolutely feel like it was dishonest or deceptive or harmful that you weren't taught them. Uh, in other words, if you had been taught these things, maybe you would have made a different decision or maybe not. Mm -hmm. Are there any things that you wish you'd been taught? Yeah. The history of the church that never come up with missionaries ne like or what? members. What what history? Like why does the church look the way it does today? Like how the church treated other non-white people before, specifically about the things like, cause I feel like the priesthood in my story was like a big jump in my story. And only like to find out that if you go down the history of the church, if I was, if if I knew that before, if that was gonna confirm my idea of doubting the idea of having one true prophet who, uh, one true prophet in the church who is receiving revelations for pretty much everybody on earth, but then going down the history, you see like there was no revelation there because the church kind of acted the same way politicians way and how the environment around it was there was no revelation there even though in the same time i could see that there were other churches who were granting priesthood to people of color at that time right okay it, wait let's back up because I, I i for people who don't know anything about mormonism i don't think they understand what you just explained uh -huh. what what now have you learned was the church's practice regarding the priesthood and people of color yes. prior to 1978. Tell us what yes. you've since learned for those who aren't Mormon and don't know. Yeah. Prior to 1978. Yeah. So I, I learned that uh, the priesthood wasn't granted <laughs> to people of color, right? And then prior to, yeah, prior to uh, 1978, right? So just to be clear, for 150 plus years, people of color, black people, Africans were denied the Mormon priesthood uh -huh. up until 1978. And you weren't taught this as a person of color joining the Mormon church in what year? In uh, 2016. So this is five years ago. Yeah. 2016. You are baptized to the Mormon church in Provo, having never been taught or learned that, that black people had been excluded from the Mormon priesthood for almost two centuries. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Okay, now keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so learning that and also just it literally explains why I felt strongly like okay, if I had known that this same person I keep on he hearing people saying he's true, he's true, he's true, he's true. This is Joseph the Smith, this the is prophets. the behavior his organization like you know, this is how they behaved back then, you know, until 1978. I'm pretty sure that I probably would have made it a different decision. And moreover too, I did not really understand why I was not like, polygamy was just like dismissed whenever, I, when I bring it up. Yeah, it was dismissed. I brought it up in my, in my lesson. I was like, so I talked to people and they say, you know, moments are, they practice polygamy and it was just like that's not us like 
we do not do that. So that also like uh, the documentary I watched on, on YouTube also uh, kind of like confirmed that it was like, oh yeah, like there is a section of uh, the moments that broke out. It made it seem like those people who broke out are the only people who practice it. Like it never happened like within our organization, it happened with those guys who left us. So I kind of regret not like looking into it more because I was like, okay, cool. So realizing later on that actually, no, that's not how it happened. I, I kind of feel bad for myself that I just like believed it when it was like, that's not us. Like, no, we don't do that. Like, I mean, you see your friend, one wife, right? And you've interviewed with our community. It's always like one man, one wife. We don't do that. But going back in history and being like, okay. Joseph we, Smith did it. Yeah. Brigham Young did it. Exactly. All the prophets up to mid 1900s did it. It's uh -huh. still in the Doctrine and Covenants, DNC 132. Our current prophet and first counselor in the first presidency are both celestial polygamists. Mm -hmm. But as far as you were taught up until baptism, polygamy had nothing to do with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Am I no. correct? Yeah. He was like, no, we, we don't do that. And I even felt uncomfortable in that uh, instance because um, me, I... I had a, a previous relationship uh, that I have kids, right? And I remember kind of asking my uh, my elder about it, and he literally invalidated my my previous relationship because it was not recognized, you know, by Heavenly Father. It's not we were not sealed in the temple, you know, we were not legally married or anything. So that was just like no. You don't have to bring that up. Like, it's fine. Like, it's not something that can prevent you from being baptized, right? Which, like, looking back right now, I'm just like, uh, I don't <laughs> I don't feel good for about myself that I accepted that explanation as a person that, oh, yeah, sure, like, before you met us, before you accepted our, our practice, it, that that does not matter. It's fine. We You can basically just click reset. And you are fine as long as you're going to have a marriage in the temple and that you're going to get sealed. That's what matters. That's the one treasure that you need to make sure you're going to maintain that. So I feel bad for myself that I accepted that. I was just like, okay, all right, fine. Even though part of me was like, you cannot do that. Like you cannot just be like, oh uh, yeah. Okay, fine. That was a mistake. And, but because there are people who exist, you know, it's part of my story. It's part of my life. It's part of my past experience, and it also kind of act, affect me like in today. So the fact that that was kind of like encouraged and just invalidated, I now I feel bad about it, you know, that was never discussed. So yeah, those are probably like the three things that I feel like I was kind of not really encouraged to talk more about or like, given information because they knew that I did not know about the history of the church, of course, because for one thing, they exactly knew that I had just found out about the church the moment I came to Provo, which was that February of 2016. Not, I did not have any history knowing about the church. So yeah, it does feel like, oh yeah, you're selectively like, you know, omitting certain things that you really know that this person does not know about this. Yeah. You know? And what's, I, for me, and Carrie, you can join in here. What, what's what's complicated for me about this is I actually really, really do believe that many people who join the Mormon church, it can upgrade their lives in many ways, especially socioeconomically, depending on your background and your social needs or situation at the time. And I think Mormons aren't trying to intentionally deceive or fool people. We were all taught milk before meat. Once you have the Holy Ghost, it can help you understand things where if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you won't be able to understand it. So like it's all from a Mormon, Orthodox Mormon standpoint, it's all well-intentioned. It might even likely, probably, probably will be for your good in many ways. It's not intentionally deceptive or coercive. Yeah. And if you read Luna Corbden's Rules on Undue Influence, in addition to love bombing, there's the withholding of information that's a classic, Scientology does it, Joe's Witnesses do it. It's a classic technique of cults or high demand religions to withhold information and, and to have levels of information where once you get in and are brought in and are kind of sucked in, 
It's not until after you start committing and, and making important decisions and pointing your life in that direction and advancing in the levels that you then get taught many of the things that were withheld from you um, before. And I'll just say that, that even in my, even in my most Orthodox Mormon state, because I, the the blacks and the priesthood thing always bothered me. I don't know, Kara, I'd like to hear your position on this. And you too, McKinsey. Sure. I don't think I would have ever let it. Let's just say I had a friend who was black, who I was growing up with, and he was interested in the church. And I would not have let that friend get baptized without saying, hey, there's this part of our history that I don't understand that you should know. And I would have explained the priesthood ban. And I would have made sure that my friend knew that before he got baptized, because ethically and morally, I would have felt like that would have been dishonest. You know to, to, I would to, have to, rationalized it. It's okay because it's true. And that I wouldn't want the mistakes of men of past prophets to spoil somebody's eternal salvation. So, so you would not have disclosed. I don't think I would have. I See, think I would have. Been... But, but, but I mean, those friends of yours, mm -hmm. and I guess McKinsey, you're part of that. Yeah. I mean, honestly, and I'm not trying to like call you out. No, I mean, my my issue with that is I had a black mother that rationalized it. So for me, it was I'd already been grown up and indoctrinated with the idea that it wasn't worth disowning the rest of the religion you were about, for. Were you about to say groomed? I, no. <laughs> <laughs> Raised? Maybe. Okay. I but I mean, yeah, I'm like, if it's good enough for my mother, who is black, and it's good enough for his friend... Like, I didn't feel like I needed to be like, well, do you want to talk about this further? I mean, I feel like that was kind of my my opening to it. Like, do you have any questions? Do you have any concerns? Because I could understand someone having that. But for me, it's like that had already been answered. And although we don't know, it's good enough for my mom. It's good enough for your friend. So why yeah. should I assume that it wouldn't be good enough for you? Yeah, but but to your, to your credit, uh, I found out more about it because of the, what did you take me to in Salt Lake City? Institute or seminary. Oh, the or, um, or they had the like, celebration uh, of the oh, the being, being black and one or something. I don't know what 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 it was called. Oh yeah, they had a, a the panel church? of of people that yeah, went that, over the that, history of yeah black people. That's in the church. literally how I found out more and more information after about, you'd been baptized, which is yeah. also how I found out yeah. more about it too. I mean, yeah. So yeah. You, you eventually, were, yeah, she took me to that, and after that, uh, I remember asking. I was like. I, this is, I don't know, this feels weird. Like, in, I couldn't explain it, but at the same time, just like this new information that you just found someone actually sharing their testimony. Like, oh, yeah, like, it, this couldn't happen. And, you know, it made us feel some kind of way. And I was like, yeah, I could have felt some kind of way if I knew about this. But in that moment, it didn't exactly translate to, like, how you're portraying right now. I'm just like... Yeah, I did not, I did not feel deceived. I was just like, okay, because I came in with a mentality, okay, we are, I'm going to grow inside the church. So yeah, <laughs> here's new information, but it wasn't the kind of new information I was expecting. I was expecting new mo new information to answer my question and make me grow. But otherwise that was like, okay, you did not know this. So it's not answering any question. It's a new topic that I now addressing and I have to decide how do I feel about that whilst I'm already in the organization. So I was just like, I don't know how I feel about this. But she had, I think in that moment, Mackenzie reacted more like negatively to it than I did. I think I was in some maybe shock or something. Because what were you taught? Yeah, because, yeah, exactly. And I, I didn't even question that I grew up seeing black priests from other churches. I didn't even think about it in that moment. Only later when I was like, oh yeah, so so your revelation came later after other people already are doing it? Is it a revelation though? Because you can't review something that is already happening in people's eyes, right? So I was I don't I don't know how to feel about about that. Why did it come so late? Why did the Mormon priesthood ban lifting in 78 come 10, 20, 30 years after other churches yes. were giving blacks the priesthood, right? Yeah. 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 So I, you know, I just, so just to ask you very bluntly now, do you feel like it was dishonest or unfair to you to convert you into Mormonism without fully explaining to you the church's history with racism and, and the priesthood ban 
and without fully teaching you about Joseph Smith's polygamy, Brigham Young's polygamy, and the church's history on polygamy? Do you feel like that was dishonest and unfair? I do, um, specifically because I I was with the wording being baptized for a long time, you know, and I I would feel I don't know if I, if that's the reason why they did not volunteer more information that would impact my decision that okay we're not gonna share more negative things because already he doesn't know this and it's taking him a while to make the decision right so I feel like yeah that would that feels intentional to me that you you knew I was kind of struggling with making this decision and you decided to share more positive things and omit the negative things, it's kind of you're pushing me to the yes decision because I'm like, oh, if I share this, it's going to create more doubt, right? And you do know that I do not know that because I didn't bring it up and you know how much I know about the church. So it does feel like it was unfair. You and know? then you add to the fact that you're in, you're in a vulnerable situation as a as an immigrant and and there's all this love bombing go around, going around. It's, it's a level of influence that, that I think should give Mormon church leaders pause and they should con- reconsider that those techniques as coercive as, and as, and as having undue influence and as not providing even base levels of informed consent that people should have before they commit their lives, 10% of their income for life, get married and, and basically commit to the Mormon way of life without all the information. It's, it's totally inexcusable that in 2015, 2016, 2021, that any Mormon investigator on the planet would go through what you went through. And it's happening all over the world every single day with 50, 60,000 missionaries. They're all doing to their investigators, most, most of them, many of them, if not almost all of them, they're doing now still to investigators what was done to you. Yeah. It's, it's no good. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> I mean, it's problematic and it, and people might benefit. That's what's complicated. So anyway, I, I'm just going to apologize because you were ready to go on with your story. <laughs> we're about at the three hour mark. And I think this is a really natural time for us to kind of make this a part one. Uh, we also need to use the restroom probably and, and run to the, re- um, and, and maybe grab a bite to eat. So I'm going to, I'm going to call it and say, Hold on, because Gerald was about to share with us some really cool what happens next. Don't forget that, Gerald. <laughs> okay. And we haven't even heard from McKinsey yet. And we haven't heard about their marriage. And we haven't heard about what's happened in their faith journey since then and what landed them on Mormon Stories podcast. So that's all going to be coming in part two. So thank you for joining us part one. Gerald, thank you for sharing us with us your amazing story about how someone from Zimbabwe Ends up Mormon. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> I hope you listeners have enjoyed it. And Kara, thanks for joining us. You always add really cool stuff. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> really yes, cool stuff. <laughs> Valuable, insightful, wise stuff. Yeah, I can Google stuff over here. It makes me sound <laughs> a lot smarter. Too. You're more than Google, Kara. I knew the population of Zimbabwe's uh, LDS population up here before I was <laughs> it, off the top. I'm pretty of your good. Head. I'm pretty good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but don't go away. This will end part one of this interview and just come right back for part two, um, where you will now hear McKinsey's story and Gerald and McKinsey's story. And then what's happened in the four or five years since they've been together. So that's all coming in part two. Thanks for joining us on Warm Stories podcast. And we'll see you guys all again in just a, just a flip of the dial. Come right back. Thanks everybody. <laughs>